Salute, 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 salute. It's your boy Game Keys K back here with another one. Legion of Knicks. Again, I apologize for the technical difficulties. And now it does work. So I'm gonna zoom in. I want you to see my ugly desk. But here today with me is Ursa Demir, guy that I've met through social media, NBA analyst, has done some amazing work online on draft prospects, international draft prospects, especially. That's where I found some of his uh, uh, work um, initially, as well as all the NBA. This guy's contributed to uh, platforms such as the NBA Draft Junkies, working with guys like Rafael Barlow, well-respected um, in the budding, I guess, social media NBA analyst industry, but a guy that uh, has rung some bells around. So just want to introduce him, let him uh, provide his profile to you, and also pro uh, provide where you can we can find him at if you want to follow him. Definitely a guy that I will follow. If you guys like what I talk about here regarding draft prospects in the NBA and whatnot, you definitely like his work. So, Erson, welcome. Uh, please let them know about your profile, your background, and, and, and everything in between. Hey, Legion, salute. As I said earlier, man, you're a true gentleman. I, as I, I've learned one thing. You got to take the compliments, and I take this one, man. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And as Legion said, I tweet mostly about the NBA draft. About NBA in general, mostly about NBA. But I try to cover other teams as well. Focus mostly on the rookies and sophomores. That's my, that's my main go to. I don't really talk much about the, the, the household names, you know, more so the guys that could perhaps be household names or getting, growing in their roles. But to make a long story short, you can follow me at EDM NBA if you want to see tweets all day about draft prospects or hoops in general. Mostly college, international as well. Definitely. I'm ready to roll. No, oh, yeah, it's, it's definitely a pleasure talking to you, man. This guy uh, puts out some really cool clips online, breaking down prospects, uh, learn a few prospects this season uh, just from watching his work on Twitter. But talk to me about this 2022 NBA draft. Unfortunately, everybody heard the news today with you, man, Chet Holmgren. Um, but you've done a lot of work, it's a lot of extensive work, especially on the top prospects, the, the Chets, the Paolos. The Jaden Ivey's, you know, that's everybody knows Jaden Ivey's my son, you know, unfortunately he couldn't get to the Knicks. Uh, but just if you give your overall um, impressions on this draft and what teams are trying to do, um, who some of your favorite players are, who some of the more underrated players are, who do you think is possibly a bad fit with the team that got drafted by? If you just give some uh, initial thoughts on the 2022 draft. I think the draft is overall was if you divide it in tiers, you have, for example, tier one, a generational player. This draft doesn't have a generation of play. I think mm. this draft doesn't have uh, a real number one option on a championship team. Maybe Paolo Banquero is the closest one to that number one option is. I think that's the main reason he went number one. But overall, this draft class was loaded with good role players. Mm. Players that understand their, their roles. They understand they don't get a lot of on-ball reps. And they, they can, you know, be that six, seven, eight option on a, on a championship team. I think this class was loaded with these role players compared to last season or some seasons before. This class was really strong in that era. And for example, if I name guys from 20 to 40, it was really, no, nah, it was not a crapshoot, but basically everything you hit well, can be a huge hit, you know. For example, a guy that I was very low on, Peyton Watson, let's start off with him, go to the Denver Nuggets. I think Denver is basically focusing on the defense, their wing defense. Because they're yeah. going to bet on guys that they can, you know, develop into the next level. I think the athleticism is there, the physical body is there, the defense instincts are also there. Offensively, it wasn't really, it was a rough season for him at UCLA. He didn't play much. I had Jaime Jaquez, of course, and Johnny Juzen came back. So mm -hmm. it was for him, it was a bad context to be in. But in the minutes that he played, I think defensively, he's shown, he shown everything that mm -hmm. NBA teams are looking for. Size, versatility, I think switchability as well. I think he can guard some sort of smaller cars as well, maybe some wings. I think eventually if he hits to attend the fans, he can be a versatile player that they can, you know, use as, in a low usage role and just clean up, uh, clean up the mess of the rest of the team. And I think those guys are very valuable if want to play winning basketball. So. I want to start off with my misses. I think Peyton Watson, looking back at it, it was my main miss because he was highly touted when he came into the into the season at UCLA. He most had him as a top 10 pick. He was one of the best high school recruits. And I think if you're a guy like that, the expectations are a lot. So offensively, he didn't bring those to the table. And that's why I really 
sold my stock on him. But looking back, I think I should have done a better job at that. And he can be one of the biggest deals in this draft class, basically where they took him, purely based on the role they have. And coming back mm-hmm. on the same role, I think the Milwaukee Bucks, they got a huge deal in Marshawn Bochamp, and that's a guy I was really high on. I had him in my lottery the whole year. He, I think everyone who follows more the Seattle, uh, Seattle Hoops game even really knows him. He had a tough tough year before he signed for the Ignite. I think he eventually even spoke about quitting basketball. And then the Ignite came in his life. And you see with Marshawn Bochamp, you get one of the best wing defenders in the class, in my opinion. He's mm. very athletic, very quick, overall very ex- an excellent player. The shot is the swing skill with him. But he's so good at the rim, it doesn't really matter. I think in the G League, he played some against some guys that you're going to face this year in the NBA. It was a great test for him. And he delivered, man, especially on defense. The offense was very good as an off-ball player. I think he has elite off-ball movement. And a team mm-hmm. like the Bucks, they're another example. They don't give the ball in the in those type of guys in their hands, you know. So yeah, you gotta understand your role. And I think Marshall Bochamp is a new steal, and that was a guy I was very, very high on. He was big maybe fifteen spots later than where I had him. And of course everyone's having their and this is the but that's what the game is all about, you know, learning from your mistakes. And talking about mistakes, I think if you look at Johnny Davis, that's a guy everybody had in their top 10. Some even in their top, oh. five, top six. Uh-huh. And basically, he went to the wrong team, in my opinion. I think it was what they were going to do with him. They signed uh, you know, Will Barton. They signed the guy from Atlanta. Was his name, right? He was their uh, backup center. Let's see. Uh, backup center uh, from Atlanta? No, no, wait. You know, and you, you you think about it, and then you want to talk about his name, and then you forget. It was it was uh, it was, was elite college. I know that, but from Atlanta, look at that they group. just signed. They have Gafford. Uh, they got KP. I'm trying to think of all their bigs. Isaiah Todd. The draft. Dylan Wright. Nah, the Dylan Wright. I was going to talk about that guy. I think. Oh, Dylan. Dylan. Yeah, Dylan Wright. He played for the Hawks. Oh, the guard, guard, guard. My yeah. bad. I think you said the big. My bad. I'm sorry. You said big. That's what I say. Another guy. Nah, but I was confused because I literally lost the name. But coming back and Johnny Davis, I think everyone had him at a top ten pick. I mean, even top seven, top six, purely mm-hmm. because he was projected to be a two way player, two way ball dominant player. That's what that's the role that he played uh, in college. At Wisconsin, mm-hmm. I think defensively he was so good, and it was surreal for a guy that is highly thought as a high usage guy. I think it, that's one of the toughest evaluations to make because high usage means, yeah, he's going to get the ball in his hands a lot. He's going to decide games, but how many teams do you give the key to the rookies? You know, and mm-hmm. little teams that do it, unless you're in a hard rebuild, and the Washington Wizards don't see themselves in that role. Basically, they extended the deal, and he's their number one guy. They took in two guards with uh, Dallin Wright, of course, but now I, <laughs> I got my other guy, Will Barton. You can see both as a wing. You can see John Davis right. as a wing as well. What I'm trying to say is they used a, a top 10 pick for a guy that they can give the ball in their hands. To. And they, they made the same mistake with Denny Avdia two years ago. They picked him, a ball dominant guy in Europe, who needed the ball to. Yeah, to really show his quality, you know. And I think Johnny mm-hmm. Davis went maybe a little bit too high. Defensively, he's going to be a, a great player. I think he's going to be in the league for a very long time. Hopefully, he will stay for one team. I think he has that potential to be, you know, Bill's sidekick. Maybe play with him together and maybe in a taller backcourt. But overall, Johnny Davis, my idea when he went to Washington, I hope us he can go everywhere. Except the Knicks because I didn't want them, and except Washington because you know they got Bill. <laughs> Unless they're gonna ditch Bill, but we all know that. Right? So then he went to Washington. So now I'm looking at the last and think, what what is their plan with? This? But basically, the toughest thing in the in the draft is you can you can see a talent. You know, if you watch the game, you can see a talent. But I think the translation to the NBA is one of the toughest things. 
if you look at last year, for example, uh, I think everyone was very high on Sharif Cooper. One year later, he's out of the league. You know, it can be, it can be like that, especially when you go in the second round. It's basically, it's basically luck. Man. You don't have everything in your own hands anymore. But coming back to yeah. the draft in the hole, mm-hmm. as a whole, I think it's stacked with great role players. And I think that's the unique selling point of this draft class. And that's what that's the most important thing in the class, I think. There was those, you know, those complimentary guys, you know, because finding the star is the toughest thing. But if you have a top five pick, then that's your guess. But you have a, when you have a 25th pick, 26th pick, overall in most drafts, it's those guys usually fail, you know, because the, maybe the team doesn't make the right, correct read. Or, of course, they find the game and the 26th pick is a top 10 pick in a redraft. But when you're picking in the 20s, this year you will spoil it, man, because you are getting at least one good role player. I think a lot mm-hmm. of teams really hit home, especially the third, two teams that I mentioned earlier, Denver with Peyton Watson and the box with uh, Marshawn Bochamp. I, I will say, so you brought some really good points. Now, Marshawn Bochamp, I love his story, right? This guy's been around five high schools, been kind of all over the place, right? And when you look at that, the G League Ignite team, you know, me, suit to code, suit to the people that are, are tipping on my channel, when we talk about the G League. It's it's weird how <sighs> there's definitely a difference between how developed players in college and in the G League. And I think one thing that you have to take into account with Marshawn is that he was playing with guys like Jaden Hardy, playing with guys like Eden School. You know, there were so many mouths of feed on that team. And the thing with Marshawn, right, you know, outside shooting was relatively quiet. I think he shot, if I remember, I think he shot poorly throughout high school. If I remember, I might be wrong on one, but I know at, at the G League from the outside he shot poorly. But one thing I did like about him, I liked his pull-up game for the mid-range, right? And I think that – if you explain now, you brought up a great point with Milwaukee, right? They don't really put the ball in the hands of their wing guards like that. Uh, you know, outside of Drew, like you've seen a little bit from guys like Jordan Noir come off the bench. Um, and then I just wonder, do would they allow Marshawn to kind of develop as more of a, a on ball player? I think he actually, I think that's an underrated skill because people say, Oh, he's three and D. And I'm like, if you're watching, he can actually create a little bit of space. You know, he also, and another thing too, people don't give him credit for, you know, he even though you would have called him a plus playmaker. He did have some playmaking chops with the G League. Like I watched a few, uh, a few games, like the full games that you, you can find on YouTube. If you couldn't catch them on ESPN, it's like, oh wow, that's a nice look pass. Guy would cut into the basket. You know, he's able to create space with the dribble, kind of lowers the defender in, kind of low that you know that guy's defender in, and a guy make a backdoor cut, makes a pass. Like he he has a nice fluid game. And really, the only thing that's holding his back, holding him back, is his outside shot. Now, Johnny Davis, salute to Jay Boogie because he's gonna. He's going to kill me. I, I I wasn't the biggest Johnny Davis fan, but it's like I did not dislike him. Like, when you look at his team, Wisconsin, you know, he was really the only guy on that team, right? And you make an excellent point with usage, right? When you see these guys coming from college, and it's like the war between, okay, is it – if he's this inefficient with this high of a usage and he's a main guy, how does that translate to the NBA? And so many times you see where guys could – they could come to the NBA and – they find a way to, you know, change their games to be, okay, I'm more of an on-ball, off-ball guy, uh, cut to the basket, uh, be able to shoot off the ball, be able to catch and shoot from the corner. And there's some guys where they can't really – their game, they just can't make that transformation. Then you also have guys that they go sometimes go to the wrong team, right? And I wasn't a Sharif Cooper fan. Everybody knows I was, I was just like, ah, I'm not really – big, I'm too small, not explosive enough. Like, there's a difference between Sharif Cooper and, say, Kenny Chandler, right? But, you know, you look at a guy like Johnny Davis and – Everything is the outside of the explosiveness, like the crazy quick first step. When you watch his game, everything screams NBA ready, but he's just missing touch. You see him in a post up, the footwork is good. You see him create off the dribble, come off the wing, come off a screen to shoot that little mid range shot, is that it's just not hitting. So when you say you got drafted by the wrong team, I mean, man, you make a great point. You got Bradley Bill, you got Dylan Wright, you got these guards. And I really don't know what the hell Washington wants to do. Um, I, I don't, I'm not, I really don't know what they're trying to do with that team. Um, I will say this, there may be space to use a little bit more, uh, more on the ball because remember they were playing with Raul Neto uh, a lot the past few seasons and no offense to Raul Neto. He's, he's had some decent games. He reminds me of kind of like a TJ McConnell type, right? Um, but I could see Johnny Davis being kind of like this big six, five, 
kind of do it all combo guard who kind of comes in, sets up rally bill, kind of finds his game again on the defensive end. He's going to be hounding guys in the, from, the, uh, from the backcourt position. But I, I can kind of, I, again, I, I'm 50 50, man. I, I don't want to write him off, but it's like, damn, when you watch him, it's like he's, it's a big ass what if with, with, with Johnny Davis. Um, and also the tangibles are there. The guy can read that. Like everything is there but the touch. So watch them. They do have they do have some work uh, uh, cut out for them to develop a guy, John Davis. I think that he has a decent ceiling if he can get that touch, the shooting touch. I think he'd be solid because everything I watch about his game is like he knows how to get to his spots. It's just so NBA ready. But um, let's talk about the, the big guys, man. You got Paolo. You got Chet. You got Jabbar. You got Jay Knighton. And I've talked about this before. It's a, it, now, you, you do bring up a great point. There are a lot of rotational players in this draft. You know, when people say it's a weak, it's weak or not. Obviously, you're talking about top end talent, maybe tweaking that regard, but there are a lot of role players. But I look at those four teams, man, and I want to ask you this. Me personally, I think two teams to watch out for from those four teams. I think of the Pistons because I think that Cade is an excellent I, – I love his game. He's an excellent playmaker. I think Jane Ivey has a change of pace guard next to him. Because Sadiq Bey is probably best as a third kind of guy, be able to hit from the outside. He's not a, he's not a number two guy. I think Jane Ivey, with his speed, attacking the basket, just provides you a different element. Kate is a guy that he'll set you up for the first three quarters. For, for the fourth quarter, he knows how to pick his spots. He knows how to attack the defenses. X, I, I love I love Kate's game, right? And I think that you got to watch out for the Pistons in the next few years. I even mentioned guys like Jalen Duran. Then on the flip side, too, you got the Rockets, who – Again, this is a team they have Bulls, they have offensive talent, right? They got Green, Josh Chris, but they still got KPJ, who me personally, I think they may have to move on from. But something that they, they improved upon significantly through the draft, just in theory, is defense. Jabari Smith, you got Terry Eason coming in. Um, and you have another, even though he's not a great defensive player, but Alfred Al- Al- Singer got a lot more comfortable last year. And they preach, Silas preached a lot about patience. A lot of these guys have kind of grown into the games. You saw the second half of games. They were, beat. they were playing some tough games last year. If I remember, I think they took like the Lakers when the Lakers were still, ugh, you know, somewhat okay. I think they like took them to like the final shot. Really tough game. So I just wanted you to talk about when you look at the young teams, and not, it could be outside those four teams, but when you look at especially those four teams, who do you look at as their built that that foundation in the next two three years? That's a playoff contending team. That's a team that. The, their, their trio or their, their their core group of young players are going to do something. You also could talk about, you know, OKC, a team. Sam Press has been stacking talent for the, I don't know how many freaking years. Everybody, the shortest play is going to be 6'6", six, six, sort of start, start and play outside of the door. It's probably going to be 6'6", six, six in SGA. You know, if you just talk about some of the young foundations in the NBA, who do you think probably better uh, prepared themselves and bolt, bolstered themselves through this draft? I think it's all in the magic. Bro. I don't have to think long about this one because – not basically because they got the number one pick this year, but that team is so stacked with versatility, man. If we start with Wendell Carter, I think he can be one of the best big men in the NBA in a couple of years. Right now, he's switchable on defense. He whoa, 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 whoa. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Urson, Urson. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> you said what? Wendell Carter is good. Don't get me wrong. He's good. He got injured line in Chicago. Say that. You you making hot takes on my show. You just you just go. You just buy. It. Say that one more. Say it with your chest. Say that one more time, bro. One more time with my chest. I think Wayne McCarter is going to be one of the best big men in the NBA in a couple of years from now. I think he has everything, man. He developed the shooting touch in the mid range. And three, as a stretch big, he's also he's switchable on defense. I think called Jamal Mosley. If you look at Dallas a couple of years, the defensively, he, he had a really large role in that, you know. And at the end of last season, Orlando Magic really grew as a team on defensive end because they have Jalen Suggs in the backcourt cleaning up the mess. I think in the front court, I think Mo Bamba, the, the, basically what didn't hit with Mo Bamba, what Dan McCarthy did very well is the switchability. Man. I think Ben McCarthy is his best at the four. At the five, I think his skill set as maybe as a pick and roll defender is not really that, that, that high, but that's okay. You know, he can be first. But in terms of versatility, if you look at that front court, if you look at Look at Bach. Look at Franz Bach. He's an, I think he's an elite off-ball player. The best for IQs off the charts. I think Germany has that new future star, man. But the best thing is he doesn't. He, he isn't the star in this team. I think he can create for others, create for himself. He's so scalable, man. You can use him as a spot-up shooter. You can let him space the floor off the ball. 
And with that size, I mean, 6'10", 6'11", as a 38 playmaker, I think he, he can handle the rock, create for others. He doesn't have to do it all the time because the team is so stacked. And you got Paolo, man. Paolo is a walking mismatch. I think you can double Paolo with his playmaking. He can, he can, he can finish you, man. He can fight his open shoot. I think the passing traits on Paolo that made him special. Man. I think that's the case that made him the number one overall pick. Because defensively at Duke, it didn't really look good, especially no. off the ball as a team defender. He wasn't really focused, you know. But I think with Paolo, it was mainly the arrogance because if you look at the guy, six eleven, two fifty, he knew he was better than everybody else, and he showed it. But he wasn't really focused on defense, man. Even at the defense, that was his biggest knock on him. At the beginning of the season, he didn't really good. But as the season evolved, he really got better as a team. Mm -hmm. I think one-on-one, -on -one, he's decent. But Paolo is so good offensively as a passer in the post. I think he's a shooter. He doesn't have to be elite at defense because he has Wendell Carter against the team on the match. He has Jalen Suggs in the back for the team on the match. I think if you look at the Orlando Magic team, man, I think they're so stacked. I think the only thing that's going to get in that way is health. I think Mark Hell mm. Fultz. Hopefully, this is his last injury, and he will be that leading point guard. You have Jalen Sachs, who doesn't have to be a ball-dominant player. He is not a good shooter, but he has, doesn't have to be a ball-dominant player. And if you look at that front, well, those three guys are going to have it. I think uh, Paolo is going to be the leader of that team. Gonna mainly handle the ball. You got Wendell Carter is gonna play at four and at the five. Maybe a Franco with Bomb at the five, Wendell at the four. Or maybe a taller line where you can maybe see Franz at the two. It's so versatile, man. They got a lot of size. They got a lot of ball in them. They got some good spot of shoes this year. They got Gary Harris back. I think that says a lot, man. Don't be shocked if they'll land on Magic get to the play in last season. Uh, this season. Last season I was humiliated that we lost against them. Twice at MSG. But this season, this season, if they whoop our ass, I, 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 I'm not complaining, man. I think that team Bro, is so good, man, really. The Orlando Magic, that, I can talk about them all day. That was depressing. But, I mean, look, and they, they have just such a weird team because, look, I wasn't the biggest believer in Franz Robin. Sue to coach, that was his guy. Um, and they have three guards on that now. Marco Fultz, I had to dig deeper into his game because you look at his splits, he's an excellent playmaker. Like, I, I you know, you look at him. And you think of Slasher, obviously, you know, you have that injury allegedly. I don't want to get in trouble. Uh, but he has, like, that thoracic outlet syndrome thing that messed up his shoulder, allegedly. Um, and, you know, the shot is, you know, the, the jump shot is just not there. Something's off. But when you talk about playmaking ability, he is excellent. Now, you make a great point. Can, can he stay healthy? Um, Jalen Suggs, another guy, you know, his shot wasn't there last year. Um, but this guy, and he also got hurt, too, but defensively. I mean, and also he had some games attacking the basket. I think it's a confidence thing with him. You know, he's always had the intangibles coming from Gonzaga. He was a football player in high school. Um, if he gets that shot to go, even just to be slightly average or average above average play, he could be a, you know, a major player from that garbage. I, I liken him, his game, because I watch a lot of him at Gonzaga. I, I liken his game a lot to a, a Billups. He has that, like that Billups type of temperament. And Billups, as in when he was with the um, – with the the, uh, the Pistons. Even though Bill's coming into the league, he was an athletic guard, he's just you know, moving around a lot. Um, and then you have a guy like Cole Anthony, who to me I think is at best a six-man a six type of guy, a guy could pour on a lot of points from the bench. I'm not sure if he's a lead guard type of player, very talented player. And like you said, last year they beat us twice. You know, Cole Anthony had the 29-point game, Terrence Ross had 22. They had the other game where they had ten, five guys in the starting lineup in double figures, and it was just – Feeding off our mistakes. It was Mo Bamba beasting at the boards. They have talent. And Jamal Mosey's a development guy. He's a very patient guy. So, you know, he's a guy who prefers uh, – uh, he said he prefers a lot of passing, moving the ball around, make it really, really simple. Um, so this year, you know, my two teams are the Rockets and the Pistons, but I agree with you. Do not be surprised. I, I don't know exactly how they're going to cook it up. But don't be surprised if the Magic are making some, some, some noise in the East. If Paolo – he has such a polished game. And you you make you make great point. You know, his defense had new kind of stuff. He had games where he was unsure about shooting the three. You saw I forget I forget which game it was. It was against Auburn. I can't remember which one, but I remember Coach K was screaming, shoot the three, shoot the three. So it's a confidence thing with him too. But you're talking about a a, a, a matchup problem, night in, night out. I I I'm pretty sure you watched the game when they played Gonzaga. First half, he was beasting on Chet. Chet could not guard him. You know what I mean, like and and you know, I just watched the magic and I have to agree. That is a, if they could find the, the perfect rotations. 
Uh, and then obviously, you know, trade whichever player doesn't fit from that guard position. It definitely scary. But I wanted to talk to you about another team. Obviously, everybody knows the bad news. And this is why you don't play 100% in a pro-am game. But if you could talk about Chad now. OKC Thunder, Sam Presti, he's hoarding picks. He's hoarding young talent. Um, they're basically big enough, building a big-ass team. And you see it around the league, too. You could even talk about the Magic, right? Getting these big, versatile playmakers who can create ma- just big matchup problems, right? You had Josh Giddy, who I wasn't the biggest believer of last year, and I had to eat some crow. Josh Giddy was he 6'7", 6'8", uh, a boy handling big. All he has to do really is get a sh- his, his jump shot down pack. They drafted the guys like Jalen Williams and the other Jalen Williams. Jalen Williams kind of uh, from Santa Clara, 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, big wingspan, uh, can attack score in a myriad of ways. You got Jalen Williams, an excellent passer. Uh, from Arkansas, you got freaking uh, – I've still got SGA who it feels like they're trying to trying to sell to the highest bidder and get a, a bunch of draft picks or a, a big package from. Uh, they also obviously have Chet who got hurt today. But Chet home going to get a, 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 a just a matchup problem. Can you just talk to me a little bit about, about what you think OKC is building up, who you think they're going to try to trade off? How do you see the vision of, of OKC like kind of uh, uh, crystallizing? Because I think that maybe they take one more year in a draft if they can – Somehow get a win by Um, maybe even you know, Scoop obviously is another a great talent and probably coming to them too. But just talk to you about OKC. What do you think Sam Presley's trying to do? Uh, and what do you think they'll probably try to do in that 23 draft? Well, regarding the Thunder, I think the whole tanking thing with them is so overblown because they were in the bubble, they were playing in the playoffs. It was maybe that three years ago, and I think when KD left that team, it was. The moment they, they knew this 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 is not gonna work with Westbrook, and they lost some time in my opinion by not making moves while he was still there, or you ditch him, he start well, right over right away, or you get you're gonna get them some help, man. and they tried with Paul George, and when the Clippers signed Kawhi that day, and they said, you know what, we're gonna overblow you, we want Paul George. That was mm-hmm. that was the moment Sam Presti couldn't you know take a step back. And regarding the rebuild, I'm very impressed with what they're doing because they are adding a lot of size, a lot of ball handling again. I think those two things are maybe the fundamentals of the new NBA. Wings, ball handling, a lot of size, a lot of versatility, position as basketball, you know? And you mentioned Jalen Williams. That's another guy I wasn't really high on this year, but I understand why they took him so high. Because the physical tools are there and he has shown flashes of a lot of things, but he wasn't elite at any of them. In my opinion, but that's okay because it's a prospect for a reason that you're going to develop it. And Usman Deng, if Sam Presti is going to offer you three first round picks for a guy, you got to know he wants him, man. And Usman Deng, I think I had him at the top 10 for uh, at, at a certain point. He had a rough start of the season down in New Zealand, but he didn't speak English. There was a whole COVID situation. I think their whole coach almost died because of it. The whole team went. Mm-hmm. And it's not in Australia, it's New Zealand. There's a big ass sea between it. So, it's not that, that, yeah, it's not just like, you know, a team from Hawaii. It's, it's, it's a US based team, but is it really uh, close to the US? It's not. It was most of off court problems, not personal problems. But, you know, he had to take his time to adapt. With Usman Jang, he got a guy that's 6'10, who can run pick and rolls at a very high level, create his own shot more of a confidence thing with him, but he gained his confidence throughout the year, and he took that next step, and because Hugo Besson, another French guy, he was the, the guy that the New Zealand Breakers when the season started, and his game declined. As the year went on, Usman Jang really take his role, man. I think if Sam Press is going to give you three first round picks from giving this guy, he was booed at that night, but he's going to be, I think he's going to be a very, very solid, maybe six-man type of player. One you can use in different situations, in the starting five, maybe in the second unit, give him the keys, because he has a very good handle, in my opinion. He can play, make, run, pick and roll, very good. But the shot needs some work. At the rim, it doesn't really look that good as well. He's very crafty. If you look at his footwork, that's one at a very good level as well. But it's still he's still a very raw player, man. I think the the flash are just, just like with Jalen Williams, but. It will take a couple of years to really make a good NBA player out of that, you know, and that's okay. 
But I think if you look at the upside, I think a lot of pick is really the price you have to pay. And regarding Chet, I think Chet is something else. Mm. He wouldn't be my number one pick this year because I don't think Chet is a guy you're going to build your whole franchise towards and make him your number one option. But Chet is what I think the Cavs are trying with Mobley. You know? But in the lesser version, mm. Mobley is easily top 10 future NBA player. Mm. Do their thing on the boat at both ends floor. I think physically he's also ready for it. I think with Chet, defensively, his qualities don't match with the four and with the five. You know, he's he's in between. I think at at, at the five, in the post, in the low post, how is he going to defend a guy like Yoko for MB? I think he doesn't stand a chance. I, the argument about that the boy skinny, I hated that. One. I wanna, I'm not going to talk about that one because he is tough. Maybe he's not built 300 pounds, but he's tough. Man. I think as a rim protector, he's one of the best, I think, in the last couple of seasons. Purely because he has such a high understanding of the game, man. He's very switchable. And that's where he, I think, as a four, that's where his qualities really come to place. You know, he can play as a stretch four in offense, can handle the rock himself. He didn't do it at the Gonzaga, but we all saw what he did in summary. But regarding his defense as a rim protector, as a switchable defender, as a pick and roll defender, he has the whole package, man. But I think the offense is really how much usage I'm going to give that guy. Because I think as a defender, he's going to leave his mark on the NBA for sure. But as an offensive player, I think he has to grow into that role with a team that's, I think, almost drowning in ball handlers, drowning in guys that are going to create their own shot with Shea, with Giddy. He talked about the shooting. If he develops that shooting, how, how much is going to be left of five for Chet, man? That's the log jam they OKC have to fix, but a luxury problem like that, every team will, every team would like to have, have that. And I think if they look at the rebuild OKC as a whole, they took in Chet as a future second option, maybe as a future star. If you're really gonna swing at the offside and you're at the top, you know, but they got a lot of very good role players. And the, the OKC remember last season where almost every player got one million dollar extra. They got so much cap space, but they don't care about if you pick a guy in the lottery or the twenty in the twenties. They can pay those guys. Man. They can extend those guys, and I think even if they really have a really good team, that owner is going to be in the luxury tax because he sees that they create a star with Shea. They and maybe have a future star in Giddy, especially if he has that jumper man. That, and man, man, look out, man. they got Chet, the defensive anchor. That team is loaded with talent, but they will be losing for maybe one or two seasons, I think. They're not ready mm. to be in the play right now. I think they are going to be, even if Chet wasn't injured today, let's hope he's going to be better as soon as possible. They will pull him out in February. You know how it goes. They want to they mm. win by Amala next season, man. They talk. They talk. talk. They want Chet at the four and Vemba at the five. Just the uh, lineup of five seven footers, man. Because Sam Presti is crazy, man. He's gonna do everything. He's, at a different he's, he's bugged out. And, and by the way, we didn't even mention my guy Trey Man from foot. Like this team has so much freaking young talent. And you may that God, God bless you for being here. I said the same thing regarding Chet, right? Because you and you may maybe you, you didn't probably mean to do this, but what you're saying is a billion percent perfect. When you talk about Evan Mobley, one thing that I like what the Cavaliers did was that they got Jared Allen to be his protector. Because if you – I'm pretty sure you watched it. Mobley struggled a little bit. When Jared Allen went down last year, he wasn't as effective offensively. It, it just did not look the same, right? He has to do a lot more on, on the, uh, uh, at the at the uh, uh, the front in the front court position defending at them. And I think that Jared Allen was such a great cover for Mobley. Um, and I think that, that – I, I, I wish OKC had that same option of – having just a big rim protector, allowing Chet to operate from that four position. Because you make a good point about him being a post one out. Again, he played the WCC. No disrespect to the WCC, but he's playing against guys like BYU and St. Mary's. He's not seeing these, but he makes night in, night out. Right. right. And so when he gets the NBA, I would have loved – and, again, you see it, you know, with the injury, knock on wood, that, you know, hopefully he comes back a healthy, talking about ligament tear possibly. That sucks. But he is a guy – that because he's such a tweener, like you said, that four or five position, I would love to see a five to sit back and protect the paint while you could sit, you could have Chet on the perimeter, just hounding, 
if, if it's if it's him switching, if it's uh, you know if it's a bigger four trying to take him to the basket, then having Giddy can kind of help uh, 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 you know in the past uh, in the driving lanes, and you have a, a big five down low to help. Ch- like I, I I agree with you a billion percent that Chet it's such he's such a an anomaly or an enigma in terms of the, like what exactly is he, especially at the defensive position. So I, I wish that they had a legit five to kind of protect him. It kind of sucks now that I guess so ease him back in. Um, but in terms of what OKC is doing, man, I agree with you, man. I think next year they're trying to they trying to uh, uh, twerk for Wimbayama, man. Wimbayama, to me, we're going to get to the 2022 draft, but Wimbayama is, when healthy, he's an alien. Like, he's a guy that kind of made your man Chet look a little small when they put you – know, Wimbayama, he's so weird. Like, he's so skinny, real thin, and he has such functional strength. Like, that doesn't happen. Like functional strength, obviously a strong guy, but it's like it's. I, I see. I saw him play against Ismo Kamagate, right? And they called two fouls on him on Wimbayama. Those were not fouls. And and if you look, if you look at Ismo Kamagate, because you've covered him, he's a strong kid. He's a strong, stout kid. And Wimbayama blocked him like it was nothing. And Wimbayama has no meat on his bones. I'm, I would be surprised if he's 220, 230. When you get, like he it, so. Next year for OKC, I don't know exactly what they want to do with guys like SGA. I still think that because remember they try to, they were getting feelers for him uh, two years ago, right? And I think that you know they they put that their price really high to kind of just kind of say, oh, you know, what would you give us for for uh, SGA? I don't know what they're gonna do with him, but I can definitely see him like you said. They get a Wimbayama. You're gonna have Wimbayama, Giddy, Chet, and all three of those guys could handle the ball, handle the rock. Presti's experiment right, to, right now. After he lost KD, he was like, you know what? And obviously after K, uh, Westbrook left, it didn't work with him, Melo, and um, Paul George. He's just like, you know what? Let me be on the forefront of exper- ex- experimentation in NBA. And that would be very scary if they get Wimbayama uh, on that team. Really, honestly, guy, if they get Scoot, if they get freaking even freaking one, the Armour Thompson, they're going to be a very scary team just talent-wise. Um but another team I wanted to, you to talk about because I don't he's a big question mark. And you know, I would love for you to talk about if this is gonna be a new trend in the NBA uh during draft time. Your man Shaden Sharp. You know, the guy comes in, <laughs> I'm not laughing at him doing it, but he tore his rope, I think tore his rope container cuff or injured his shoulder, something like that within the first 15 minutes of playing a summer league. Right? This is a guy that even though he didn't have an agent. He played the, him and his advice, who it may be, they played the game extremely well. A weak draft, you do have talent attached to your name. Don't play. Don't just play. Let the mystique drive your value up. Let, let's let's not even risk uh, uh, getting you out, out of the lottery. Even though I don't think he was ever going to fall beyond the lottery. You know, the Blazers pick him up. I, exa- I don't know exactly what, what the Blazers are trying to do. I do like I, – I like some of the talent. Like Greg Allen, I like underrated pickup is um, Walker. Uh, from uh, I believe from Colorado, I, I like his two way ability. He's well, gonna, I think he's gonna be a, a, a real. He's gonna be one of these guys you look up in the next years. He's a kind of like a double doubles kind of. Uh, you get kind of like a Paul Millsap type of production from him. A little bit probably more defensively. Um, uh, they have some good players. They have CJ Ellaby. Like they have some. They have some talent. And even uh, a guy wasn't the biggest fan of from um, Tennessee, the guard. Um, I'm seeing his face right now. Well, I can't remember. The guard from Tennessee, quick. Explosive, but kind of not really crazy. I can't remember Kenny his name. Chandler, but he, he went to Memphis. No, not Kenny Chandler. Not, uh, year before, year before. They had um, they had Jaden Springer. You played with Jaden Springer. Crap, I can't. Why I can't remember his name? But and I, know, I see I his face right now. Too. Hey. Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, it's gonna come to me. But uh, talk about Shaden Sharp and what what do you make of Shaden Sharp? Uh, you know, they were, they were they get, everyone talks about him being a, a, a skillful player, but there were reports about is he as explosive. On the ball, as you know, people have said he was. You know, s- scouts are kind of all over the place on Shane Sharp. Uh, and again, he's a big question mark. Now, I don't know exactly what they're going to try to do with Dame Lillard. I don't think that's going to be a run to try to make a player run Dame. I think you need a lot more in that team to even think of that. Think about that. They're just trying to delay the inevitable. But if you could talk about uh, Shane Sharp, how do you like? What are your evaluation of Shane Sharp? Um, and what what to really make of his skill and and, and how the, the 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 Blazers kind of use him? Is he is he a guy that you think can kind of elevate Dame Lillard to be a, a one two punch in the West even try to make some noise or is it 
kind of we're moving on from Dame, but kind of a slow, drawn out process and change shots going into the future. I know that really. That's the basic answer because remember a couple of months, maybe at the end of last year, his name really popped on the radar as the potential number one pick, even next year. And I was looking at the guy and as his high school tape, and I was like, I don't really see what's a big deal about it, you know, because in high school, mm. the most overrated part from overrated part for me is because I want to get better at the high school. I'm not an expert in high school, but what I did saw was every guy that's going to be a high recruit is dominating in high school. They're the ball dominant players, and some don't try on defense because they know they're going to be five star recruits in every school one. So why do they risk it? And I can I can't blame them, you know. But with Shaden Sharp, I read things like he has elite burst. Shaden Sharp does not have elite burst. I... He struggled to <laughs> get past some guys stand still. If you blow past the guy stand still like John Moran, like Jaden I that's elite burst, bro. If you need a screen mm-hmm. and you barely make it, that's like, uh, you know, Eric Cartman uh, jumping from skateboard across homeless people. <laughs> he barely made over one, but everyone's talking about he jumped over 50, you know? And then with Shane and Sharp, is the, the whole mystery. I think you hit the nail on the head with that. The whole mystery made him, you know, he made him, you know, the the blueprint of the perfect NBA play, Shane and Sharp. The, the, the whole conversation was that. And I think if you look at what can he potentially be, not to, you know, uh, to destroy the guy, but I really buy the talent because as a shooter, I think if the shot really translates in the NBA, that's I think one of the best in last year's draft class. Easy. And I think the way if you look at the pull up, beautiful release, I mm-hmm. think that the traits were the, the traits were really there. He's very uh, the athleticism off the charts. I think he can if you get to the rim, the finishes are very impressive. But again, it's high school. I think if you look at Jaden Hardy in high school, it's going to be 10 times more impressive. But he chose to play. And he was picked 30 spots after Jaden Sharp. And he grew as a player in the G League. And not to make it the Jaden Hardy story, but pure as an example. Jaden Sharp is, you know, Mike Schmidt. He's the best in the business. He's now the assistant GM of the Portland Trailblazers. And he picked him. So he has an idea. Because Portland is not going to lose. They are going to try to win. Dame is back. Mm-hmm. They re-signed, you know, sorry, they extended, uh, you know, they extended Anthony Simons. They took a bet on Jeremy Grant, and they're going to try something. They got Yusuf Nukic back. Will they win a championship? I don't think so, but you never know how crazy the West is. Look at last season, man. We expected the Suns to be get their ass moved by the Dallas Mavericks in Game 7. Why, how much? How many points? Oh. Everything can happen, but Shady Sharp is going to be a long-term partner. That can really hit, and if he hits, he's an all-star, sure. But he doesn't hit, it's a top 10 pick wasted, and we're an expert. Mm. You know? We know all about top 10 picks when you waste it. Oh. We know all about the, the, the flashy story. We picked the guy who was um, a very good shooter in the tournament. He's now uh, in Detroit. Will he play? I don't think so. Frank Neokina, defensively, he was very good. He had a, he had a crazy wingspan. That was, that was seven, two. The whole, the whole yeah. idea of Neil Kina makes sense. But it didn't work in New York. And it happens, you know, that's part of the draft as well. And instead of blaming the GM or, or the team, is sometimes talent and team doesn't match. And I think the kid has talent, man. He's really talented. But it isn't like if you open Twitter and you just search Shane and Sharp, I think 80% of the things you'll see is not 100% true. Especially the part mm. about the first, I will never buy it. Never. Mm. Uh, and you, I, we had a discussion and it was, you know, suit to Nick for pointing this out too, um, Nick G. And it was like, scouts have concerns about the, exp- it's, it's been a little bit overhyped. And that's the thing I'm a little bit scared about in these weaker drafts. You're going to have some of these kids who they're going to use the power of the media, social yeah. media. And then we're not going to act like this hasn't happened before. I remember when I was in high school, I don't remember, I don't know if you remember, Nikolai Tishvili got drafted by the Nuggets. And no one watched him. <laughs> and he went, um, did he go fifth or sixth? Nikolai Tishvili. I'm trying to remember. But he went in a lottery. And he was an absolute 
bus. Now, granted, international games a little bit different, even though now it's a little, in terms of scouting and 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 watching these players' developments a little bit better than what we had even in the early two thousands. But uh, you just wonder if they're going to be. He's not the first guy who's going to be gaming the system in weaker drafts. Um, so it's it's a little bit. It's going to be a little bit scary uh, in the future, but you uh, you you put the nail on the head, man. He, you get – I don't want to say boom or bust, but when you look at a guy like Shane Sharp and expectations, you're not, you're not looking at – because, again, defensively, he's not this shutdown player. So it's not as always he's going to be a 3-and-D guy. There have been questions. I'm not going to say it's valid. There have been questions about his attitude and whatnot. And that, you know, some of that, 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 that's typically put on guys who are score-first players, right? So it is what it is. Um, but, yeah, that is – the, the Blazers had a lot of places to – I mean, they needed talent, period. Um, Shane Sharp, he could be a great investment or he could be a bust. Uh, to make it out in the West, now, granted, you, 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 you know, you took a little – you took a shot at my – I would say my sons, but CP3 is my favorite point guard, and it, it was one of the most depressing things uh, to watch last year. That was bad. That last game, they had no answer. It was basically Hound, Booker. And let me give the Mavericks credit. They don't get enough of this. Defensively, what they've been doing on that team, even using Luka as like a help side defense, like I got to give it to Jason Kidd. That, wow. I, he's done – with Luka, people out there, again, I didn't even think – and I think the, they had a better defensive rate than the Knicks last year. Um, I think they did, uh, if I remember uh, right. I think they're like top 10. Give it to Jason Kidd. He – I got to give him his properties. He knows how to coach. Um but another team out in the West, man, that we have to talk about, uh, got to talk about the Spurs. What is Greg Popovich doing? Now, granted, the DeJounte Murray trade made, made sense. Uh, get some more assets for 2023. Um, they've been a team that's been – they've been drafting, trying to go through guards for the past few years, and they haven't really hit on a, a, a proper backcourt to kind of carry this team. But you got you got guys. They, they, they drafted some talent. Malachi Branham. Blake Wesley, I know you've talked about him. Freaking Rafael Barlow, that's a guy that I think he's going to be one of the biggest sleepers in the draft. Uh, Jeremy Sohan, who I liked a lot. He's just one of these glue guys who can pass, facilitate. Um, a high-level high playmaker. And, or, or, let me say high-level potential as like a, a Boris Diaw plus type of player. Um, a guy who can guard the five, more of a force type of player, but smart, heady player. Only thing that's really lacking is his outside shot. Um, but they have some players on that team. Um, the other team, I'm, I think they're gonna they're twerking for win Bayama. Everybody's in for the win Bayama uh, sweepstakes. So just talk to them about the Spurs and what do you think they're trying to do? They have some plays. They made they they got to play last year and they played tough, right? Kellen Johnson, talented player. Uh, Denver so uh, came over as, as a decent three and D uh, uh, player last year, um, and they have some talent. Now, granted, you know their, their front court was a little lacking. Um, they still have a uh, Yerka uh I believe they they traded the other guy. Um, I forget his I forget his name. Drew Eubanks. Uh, Eubanks, thank you. Um, but yeah, if you could just talk about the Spurs are doing, how do you think? What do you think Pop is trying to do? It seems as if he's just trying to find the right fit for his backcourt. And also, I forgot guys like Josh Primo as well too. Um, if you just give me some call on the Spurs, and if you think that they're twank, uh, twerking, twerking hard uh, for Win Bayama, because he'd be a perfect, he'd be a perfect uh, front court uh, player in the Pop of this system. But yeah, if you could just talk about uh, what the Spurs are trying to do. I think in general, if you look at that team, they got the maximum out of that big three, Manu, Parker, Duncan. They got everything they wanted out of those, the era of those guys. And I think the LaMarcus Aldridge decision was the key factor why they're in this mess today because LaMarcus mm -hmm. Aldridge, LZ at Portland, he was one of the best forwards in the league. He's, and he chose for the Spurs, and that experiment didn't really help them. And they that set them back. I think... No one expected that guy to be, I think, I don't know what type of health issues he had to be stopped playing heart. for a year. Maybe heart issues, yeah. I think. Yeah. And they had to rebuild at a certain time. I think the Warriors are going to be the second team that's going to extend their winning streaks for so long. The Spurs were the first. And if you look mm. at the rebuild, I don't think they are doing that bad because they got Devin Vassell, who is projected to be a two-way player. I think personally the term two-way player gets thrown about too easily. Oh, mm -hmm. he's good at defense and he scores 20 points. Oh, it's a two-way player. I think a two-way player has to be elite at defense and elite at scoring, period. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you cannot be 
spoken about as a two-way player. Paul George is a two-way player. Kawhi Leonard is a two-way player. Devin Vassell, in my opinion, can be a two-way player. I think as a team defender, because the Spurs are a bad team, but if you look at that team, if you look at him specifically, he's such a good team defender, man. He's such a good feel for the game. Scoring-wise, he has to learn it all. He's getting better. I think he is one of the guys I think he's going to have a breakout here. The Spurs are going to be bad, and someone has to score points. Why not be him? And I think defensively, one-on-one, I value one-on-one a little bit less, especially in today's position with basketball. You have to guard multiple positions. And I think Devin Vassell can guard the guard, can guard the wings. And if you can do those both, that's that's elite, you know. But he still has a long way to go. But that's a very important piece on that team. I think Kelvin Johnson is another guy. He messed my guy Jeremy so on. If you look at Boris Diaw, what was his biggest trait? I think he was cleaning up the filthy work, man. I think Jeremy Sohan can be exactly the same guy on defense. Because he can play a little bit of small ball five, and teams love to play some small ball five. But he's not the best athlete. But that's okay. Because he understands the game very well. And I think the Baylor Bears are one of the best defense teams in college, especially since I started watching. And I'm not watching mm-hmm. for that many long, but if you have to ask me name a very good defensive team, I say Baylor every year. This year, I will say the same thing. I think Jeremy Sohan gave, went to the right school. He was seen as a top 10 pick, and that was that was the cap. And top five, was, I think that would, now that would be crazy. But because his role is not to be a star, his role is to be a good role player off the bench. He could complement and play for the team, maybe guard the three to five. Because the Knicks, we want Opie to guard three, but we saw what happened against the Hawks in the playoff. You know? I didn't get it. But with Jeremy Sohan, I think he can do it. I think he, despite the size, he has the, not the quickness, but he he knows his body very well for his age. So with that, I mean, he knows his weaknesses and he can play through them perfectly. And that's things with a coach like Popovich, he's going to use that one. And if you look at guys like Blake Wesley, I think he's, he's incredible. Man. As a playmaker, as a defender, he's just pure tough. Tight handle. He can do a lot of things with the Rock. I think as a scorer, he's maybe one of the overlooked players in this year's draft class. I don't mind saying that. It doesn't feel like a hot take because he really is. And he went to a school where it was, it was a popular school. But if you have to name five schools, would you name his? I wouldn't. I wouldn't name it. So that plays a part as well. And if you look at the team as a whole, they're just doing maybe OKC thing, but in the lesser, in the lesser extreme form. Just accumulate talent. Just let them play. Keep the good guys. Maybe the end of the bench guys are going to be draft players as well. And if you can keep those guys at a good contract, who, who doesn't want to play for pop? I know he's not going to quit. If he gets Wemba Yam, he's going to coach until he dies, man. Yeah, for sure. So that, that's because he's kind of good, yeah. I, I don't really understand where the story is coming from. He, he's addicted to winning, I think, and he lost everything now. But he's going to do it again. But this time, there's no dunk. There's no Duncan Rouse. But <laughs> that does not add to the ball. I don't know where Duncan Rouse came from. Sorry. That's not that <laughs> He's not anymore. He has to start from, uh, from zero. I think he accepts the challenge, and he has very good pieces to make something happen, but it's going to take a couple of years. I think one or two years at least before they make a play and push. I won't be surprised if they're going to be the worst team next season because they're not even trying. And I didn't even mention my guy Josh Primo, man. The, 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 yeah. One, the, one of the youngest players in the 2021 class. I think he's 19 still. Nice. Younger yeah. than most players drafted in this year's class. It's crazy, man. And I think the reason that they sent away Murray, because they got a good return, but Josh Primo was always going to be a long-term project. And in year one, he has shown such good things as a playmaker, you know, as a scorer. Still has the maturest game a lot. But that's okay, man. It's a losing team. So why would you care if you have three turnovers? Oh, mm-hmm. I don't care. Let him execute his reads is the way he wants to because he makes the reads, but executing them is what they have to learn. And I think with a young team like that, the Spurs, they're going to be bad, but they have an idea. And even mm-hmm. if they don't get if they don't get where we are, it's not the end of the world because next year's guys are lowered. We talk about it later, but the Spurs are in a good situation, man. I think they 
get the call, they get wings, wings, and it's all about wings, man. And it's not going to change very soon. And they got a lot of good good guys. Up there, like Primo with the size, Cell, and I can go about Kelvin Johnson as well. They just have a good team, man. But they're not ready. So they, they still have to mature as a team. A lot of young players. And they were going to need a couple of seasons. All right, fair, fair enough. Uh, you know, I mentioned Ginobili was one of my favorite guards, even though I was not a Spurs fan growing up. Uh, but Ginobili, just one of the most underrated guards of all time, basically just came off the – I mean, Toba, he's the first one I've ever seen do a Euro step in game. Uh, just so smooth with it. He's, he's such a smooth player. But, you know, let's, let's talk about 2023 draft, man. Uh, and after this, obviously, guys, we talked about some Knicks. Don't don't just chill out. But 2023 draft, when by Yama scoop my son Derek Whitehead. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, just talk to me about this draft. It's so stacked. You got Thomas. You got Keontae George. You got Nick Smith. You got if you want to go big, then you got Trav, uh, 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 Derek Lively. You got uh, Khalil Ware. You got so many. And then overseas, you got Baba Milk. Like, well, he's coming to Florida State. But you got so many players in this draft. Talented players. Like, oh yeah, the twins. Like, it's to me. I think it's it's gonna be absolute. Excuse my language. Absolute sex this year. This this draft is sex. It's porn. Please talk about this draft. Who are your favorite players from the draft? Who are your underrated players from the draft? Talk about the international guys. Please t- talk to me because I see you post them every. T- and by the way, you insulted uh, my guy Alondez Williams when you said some other international players are best passing draft. That that's absolutely yeah. crazy. Alondez is the greatest passer of all time of any draft. But please talk about the 2020 draft. I'm only joking, of course. But please talk about the 2020 draft, your initial impressions. Who do you guys who, – who should we start looking out for that hasn't been mentioned? Who do you think is going to be, you know, maybe possibly in that realm of one by Yama scoot where we're not even talking about right now or maybe talking about as maybe a you know, fifth, six, seven guy and, you know, he could be a riser. Please talk about the 20 draft. I know you have a lot of a lot of intel you can give us, so please uh, go – Give us some, uh, some color. Yeah, man. I'm going to start off with this year. It's going to be generation. Man. You know, remember at the start of the show, I was speaking about the tiers. Tier one is generation. It's going to be MVP caliber, all NBA first team. I think this year, I'm going to give you my top five, and I still have a lot of watching to do, man. But regarding my top three, that's not going to change for the whole season. I'm that sure. And all so who's your third? Guys, Hold on. Okay. Yeah, three. I got three generational tier one players in this draft. The first one Who, is who's the Allen, third? Of course. Derek White. Okay. Oh, yo, I, yo, I, th- th- this is yo. This is my guy, bro. This is my guy. This is why. This is why I knew this was gonna work. This is why I messed with this guy, bro. This, this like, like, yo. This is my guy right here, man. Ursin, Ursin, Ursin. Talk. Talk about my guy, Derek, Derek Whitehead, please. Please, let them see the vision. They don't understand. No, no, talk. I'm going to shut up. Go ahead. Go ahead, man. Talk, 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 talk. Please. Uh, but if you look at, we talk about Shane and Sharp in high school, right? Derek Whitehead plays for the best school, best school in the country. Maybe some fans will get offended, but top five school. Okay, let's keep it uh, that way. But the things he has shown is the whole package, man. He off the ball. Off the ball movement, that's where it starts, man. Because on the ball, you can do whatever you want, but it has to be scalable. It has to be translatable to the NBA. And the league wide at is off the ball movement is elite, man. And the way he maps the court, the way he positions himself, the way he knows when to take the ball back, knows, give me the ball, can locate, you know, the big, the big, I want the handoff right there. The way he, the leader, man, the leader, man, that's special at that age. He's 18, but he has the basketball IQ. I know that's an overblown uh, term, but with this guy, you can see that the, the feel for the game, let's call it the feel for the game, is such at the high level. And I think if you look at that as a starting point, that's a 15-year NBA player. If the rest is average. And I think on the ball, the things that he's shown, man, I think the burst is absurd. Athleticism, is that, that that's not to use the elite the word elite too much because athleticism is good, but it's not the best. All right. But that's okay. You can't be the best at everything. But as a scorer, this guy is an absolute crazy man. I think if you look at this offensive package, 
the things I've seen, I, I think I've seen it. Look at uh, as fadeaway or at pure at the rim as the layout finisher, the craft, the sauce, whatever you want to call it, he has. But I think it's so smooth that an NBA coach, let's name an old school NBA coach, not Thibodeau, man, but Pop. George right? Carl. If, uh, you, if he's going to say, Pop, I got this, give me five positions, ISO. And I think he, Pop, he's going to have a high quality shot in ISO with scouting report on him. Mainly focusing on him, how to stop the league right there. And I think he he's going to be cooking, man, because he is offensive. He is so gifted, and I think that's so special. And I think on the defensive end, it's so early to tell because it's high school, man. But what, what I saw is on the defensive end, he fights hard around screens. He doesn't foul. He doesn't go in hard on a guy, but he fights tough around screens, man. He has good size. I saw some posts from Jonathan Wasserman. It was the same 6'6". Six, six. Bro, 6'6 six, six is the size is perfect. And he can got one, two, maybe three. I think mm-hmm. with RJ Barrett, one of his biggest gifted things, the size and the weight, right? The physical profile. I think the physical profile of the league wide is exactly what you want at your number one spot, at your number two spot, where you want to use it. And he went to do, together with maybe uh, three other guys who are a five star recruit, one of the best. They absolutely killed it in the recruiting. He's going to be their leader, but let's be honest, man, those other guys aren't, aren't scrubs, man. He has to settle for a lesser role, and we all know that. But the things he has shown already in high school is that he's going to be a star next year. Maybe National Player of the Year is maybe too much, but maybe an All-American. I think he's definitely capable to be that because he's their leader, man, mm-hmm. already. You don't have to look at the other guys because you, you recognize it, right? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make it crazy as this, but just name an random elite NBA player in NBA history. It doesn't really, it doesn't matter. But they all have one thing. They all have that aura, man. He walks the arena. He, you know, I got. And the Rick Wyatt has the same. And I think on a defensive end, it's not all, it's not all glamour. But on the defensive end, I think one on one, he was a little bit sloppy. But again, high school. He doesn't have to try. He's a five-star recruit. He chose Duke. He doesn't care, man. Last year, you know what was going to happen. And you have to weigh in there. Those type of things as well. But I think it's fuel for the game. Dedication to the game. Whatever you want to name it, it's there, man. And then the offensive end, off-ball and off-ball, is at such a high level. He was the best player on the court in everything that I saw. I think that's special. Because, especially considering how loaded this class is. So, the required is... I think for me, he's a generational prospect. He's unlucky that he's in this year. Otherwise, last year, he was the number one pick, without a doubt. Any GM that would have taken him, not number one, would have been, would have been five. And You're over Paolo, Chet, and Jabari. He's, for sure. <laughs> the only thing that you can use as an argument is most teams are guard loaded. So would they take a guard? But that's another subject. Pure based, pure talking on talent. He's the number one. And, and I, if you guys I, talk I, about the other two guys, Scoot, oh, yeah. that's the same. I think if you look at Derrick Rose, MVP Derrick Rose with a jumper, I think that's what Scoot is. At 70 year olds, 70 year olds in the G League against pros. Did you see Kraft in the pick and roll playmaking? I think he's the reason that he was making, man. He has so much patience as well. It was just so easy for him. I think he was so calm. He was 17 years old. 17 years old. What, what were you doing when you were 17 years old? Let's be honest. Were you balling again? Not, not that. Guys, bro? Not me. Not I that. think if I'm 50, I don't do the same thing. But <laughs> the game was no, he... Henderson is MVP. There goes with a jumper. Would you take that guy number one? I would. I, I would do it. Oh, I might. I might. There goes that. There goes. And I followed Derrick Rose from Memphis. I still remember to this day, him and CDR, all they had to do was hit the free throws. They missed three out of four free throws late in the second half against Kansas. Kansas, t- uh, they tie it. Kansas wins in overtime. Derrick Rose, I've been following for a while, and he is, you know, still with him. Obviously, injuries went nice. Still a great player with healthy, you know, but pre-injury Derrick Rose. The, the yeah, ability to – Oh, uh, he, 
this is and this was peak LeBron, this was LeBron James at his physical peak that Heat team. I think that was the best LeBron James just physically. Now, game wise, obviously he had to develop his uh, post up after the, the Dallas Mavericks and all that stuff. But you talk about peak LeBron James, who's basically the face of the league, and Derrick Rose was able to win out. So, like you say that with Scoot, and the thing I would say with Scoot too is that the mid range is there. I believe he shot forty six percent, something like that, around from uh, 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 off the dribble shots of the dribble. Which it, someone made a great post on Twitter. I can't remember who it was. Scoot, I'm not trying to steal your stuff, but whoever you are, God bless you. And they put out like they compared him to you know John Moran, all these other guards who were you know sixty percent here, twenty percent. Only thing that's missing, obviously, is a three shot like seventy percent from three. I'm not worried about that. The playmaking is there. The court awareness is there. The ability to take his man one on one is he's a dog. When dog, and he has that mid range shot. I think the outside shot is just a thing of feel. When you talk about him being able to do that against you know legit veterans, guys who are get, trying to get back to the league and whatnot. It's all there for school. Now, Dariq, I like Dariq so much. I just see him as his high level. I see him as a legit two-way player where, I, like you said, I could, he could be high level on defense and for what he does on offense, high level. Now, obviously, free throw shooting stuff like that, he has to become a consistent shooter, right? He, You know, he, the form is when you see him get to spots off the dribble and shoot that shot, it looks pretty. But he can it, it, he can be inconsistent. I think that once he gets to the NBA, be able to shoot from, uh, 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 be able to learn how to catch and shoot. Be a more, how can I put it, better player off the ball, not be a, a high usage guy at Duke, right? He'll be the, one of the main guys. It's going to be him and Derek Lively, so he's going to be probably the main guy there. Um, but I just can't wait to read why he gets the NBA. Yeah, I'm not going to say he's going to be generation. That's great. I love you saying that. I I, I like the read. I don't know generation. I ain't going to say all that. But I just love his game so much. Now, you said top three. You have two more guys to go. Who is the top five? You said top three. You gotta give me two more, cause after the, after the week, that's cool. Put some, put let's put some money on. Who you who's the the, the the four and the five, bro? The fourth one is not a dookie. Derek Lively, man, you already named him. Oh man, oh Derek Lively, man. Man. I ain't gonna get me in trouble, bro. Center positions are not popular. I know that, but I'm talking pure based on talent. Man. That's how I make my list. I'm not gonna watch Tankathon oh, and oh yeah the. Let's see the OKC Thunder. They're gonna get the fourth pick. Oh, they don't. They won't take another guard. So that's a lot of look at it, you know, because purely based on talent, Derek Lively. If you name another potential two-way player, Derek Lively is another. He has all the tools that you want in an NBA center, but he hasn't developed them. Let's say, but we don't care about that. We only see what he might can do in the NBA. That's what we're looking at, you know. Things like inconsistent shooting, or that's not. That's okay. For Derek, Derek White, he, I know he's a bit of a streaky shooter sometimes. He's taking the tough shots and he feels the vibes and he take another one and another one. And the team's allowing him, so why wouldn't he? So, but that's okay, man. He has to mature his game. He has to find his spot. But all the other things, he's doing it. So, why would we say, okay, he's a bad shooter? So, he shot 40% from three, but 60% from the line. Oh, uh, the shooting touch is not there. 40% is wide open and okay, 32. But that's not the way to look at it, in my opinion. You have to, you know, understand what NBA teams are looking for. I think last year I got a little bit better at that. Still have a long way to go, but I'm just trying to figure them in an NBA position purely based on what a team needs and what a team can offer. And I think you can offer the rig wide at, uh, for example, to the Detroit Pistons. If he goes to the Detroit Pistons, what is he going to do? He has Kate, you have Jaden Ivy, but he can adapt. But, you know, him, his qualities as a potential top three pick in this draft class will be maybe slightly unnecessary in that position. It's just a luxury problem. But I think that plays a big role as well. But coming back at Derek Lively, guards in space, has the shooting touch, very good rim protector. Mm. As a rebounder, I think he can do, do a little bit more, but that's okay. Those guys are not perfect, man. They're still kids for a reason. They go to college for the first time. They're going to learn how to play in the system some more. They're going to, mm-hmm. you know, prepare themselves in the NBA in that way. I think Derek Lively, if you look at the NBA today, if you look at the best centers in the NBA today, what do they have? They're all, or just like Carl Anthony Towns, they're all just one of the best shooters. Or Rudy Gobert, they're just elite at defense. 
it's just if you have one of the two, then you're gonna make it in the NBA for a long time as a center. And if you can stay in the floor for a long time, of mm. course. But that's something that's very hard to project with those guys because maybe you'll be foul merchant in college, who you knows? Maybe the high school stats weren't really or the high school refs were appreciating maybe a little less tight in, in college, or it's just something you have to feel in another system, you know, because those guys are stars right now in high school. And I think that's the biggest problem that people can have when they evaluate these guys. If you look at, for example, uh, I name another guy that I like, but he's not in the top 10 range, so don't worry, but Trey White. For if you look at that guy, Trey White. We said Trey who? I can hear you. Yeah, we can, uh, uh, Trey White. Trey White. Yeah. We could talk about him some more often, but so just as an example, I think if you look at this tape for five minutes, oh, this, guy's be, this guy can hoop, man. This guy uh, has a dog in him, whatever you want to say. But after that, it's okay. How is he going to play at the end of the day? Is he all going to be in college? Is he going to flourish in that role, et cetera, et cetera? So it's just the beginning part, you know? I think the whole evaluation thing is you have to create a context for him that's realistic. And I think most people are stuck in the idea of he's the best guy in this draft class, so he's number one. That's why the whole top three conversation was overblown. People that had Jabari at number one mm-hmm. had good arguments. That Paolo at number one had good arguments. But Chet goes the same, but let's say uh, Paolo goes to Houston, for example. They have Jalen Green. That's their number one option. Now, what's Paolo going to do? He's only going to be, okay, he's going to be good, but the context for him is lesser in a lesser advantage for him. And now he goes to a team where he can really be the lead, for example. But coming back at Derek Lively, I think I've gone uh, off topic for, uh, for a long time. But... No, no, you're good, you're good. I love this. Keep going. Yeah, we're so, going here. Yeah. So, you, so Derek Lively, that's your fourth. Who's your fifth? Because you said Derek you said yeah, Derek Lively. I have Khalil Weir over Derek Lively. I, I, maybe it's my bias. I think Khalil Weir can... Up from the outside, he could play in the post a little bit. Um, but that's just you said. You said Derek Lively. Um, so, but who's your fifth player? Well, I'm not top five. But my issue with Derek Lively is at the FIBA tournament. If you look at his motor, mm-hmm. that was concerning, man. I think at some positions he was like, okay, just walk a Kessler stop. I'm not gonna let this guy go by me. I'm gonna block him from behind, but I'm gonna block him on. And that looks flashy, but. Or well, in the NBA, those guys are not going to forgive you for if you're going to mis- make a mistake like that. Man. I think the motor was a yeah. really big issue, but it can be a lot of other reasons. You know, maybe he had a jet lag or something. Maybe he's a scared to fly or something. I, I don't know, but I'm just trying to find a reason that this can happen, you know, because Team USA is always dominating those tournaments athleticism. And Leo Weller has that, but the motor was... You look at that, you can say, okay, this guy can't play 20 minutes in NBA, man. That's the first thing that's going to pop up your mind. But maybe it was just a moment, you know? So I'm not going to say, well, it can't be that guy. I'm not going to say that because he's a legit lottery level prospect. But overall, that was the first concern I had with him. But coming back to my fifth guy, Baylor Bears, bro, Keontae George. Woo! If you look at him, if you look at that shot, nah, I'm not going to. Okay, I can, maybe I can use... I'm a bit interested with this. I'm going to run. Okay, I, I can't clean for that. But if you look at the shot, bro, it's crazy. He has such a beautiful release, high release. I think he's quick, has some decent birth, great athlete. I think he has the whole scoring package. I'm not going to use the term three-level scoring because in today's NBA, the mid-range is kind of taken away. Let's be honest. How many teams are based still in NBA? So the term... Three-way, three-level score is so overblown. I hate when I read it, and I don't want to use it myself. But at the rim scoring, he's going to be very good at it. And the shot, man, the shot is real. Bro. And I think at the defensive end, there's still a lot of things to learn. But again, I've watched high school tape, and I have personal life myself, so I haven't watched thousand hours of tape. You know, it's just going with what I see, going with what the NBA needs. Those five guys, they really have it at a very, very high level, man. And that's why I can. Confidently say the top three, that's the way how it is. Scoot at one, Wemby at two, Derek at three. That's my top three. But four or five, it can change. But in terms of, course, of, of course. as per today, those five guys are my best prospects. Okay, fair, fair enough. And, and, and Keontae and Nick Smith are just like, 
I have Nick Smith as my personal favorite over it, but Keontae is. I can't blame you, bro. They're good, both very good. It's just damn personal damn. preference. But yeah, yeah, yeah. It's and it could def and, and again everything could definitely change. I'm surprised you didn't mention one of the twins, which is interesting. They mentioned one of the twins because look, the twins. I haven't watched him enough have... to say okay, he's the number one. I I know some guys right. I respect a lot that say, for example, I saw last season a team would have taken number one. He could have been. I think. I do, I respect those guys a lot. A lot of guys are like, okay, the, the shot is a real concern, but okay. But the rest, let's focus on the rest some more, man. The shot can be a problem, but let's say, for example, if you're going to take Derek Rose without the three-point shot, we wouldn't take him, bro. Dumb stuff. Right? We wouldn't. Bro. Let's be honest. I right. think it's, it's either two things in NBA, NBA Twitter as a whole and draft as a, as a fault on that as well. It's either... All about the negatives, or either too much about the positives. But it's never, it's never a middle story. I want to talk about the positives never. more than I want to talk about the negatives. But you got to talk about the negatives as well and find a, a middle point. You know, who's perfect in NBA? No one is. Look at Jokic. He won two times MVP. Is he athletic? Ah, oh, man, that guy's a badass. Nope. Look at him. But he's so skilled. It doesn't matter, bro. It doesn't matter. He's schooling right. everyone. So let's be honest. It's just. Personal preference at a certain point, but you gotta, you know, put it in a context and don't weigh too heavy on, you know, I'm not, I'm not a fan of the term weaknesses, but you know, points that they have to develop some more. If he doesn't need an NBA, so why would it matter so much? So, for example, if I say, uh, let's see, okay, we're gonna use uh, free throw shooting, okay. We're mm -hmm. gonna act like Derek Lively is a very bad free throw shooter. Would I take him out of my top five at this argument? I think I might think about it because you eliminate the chances of him staying on the floor for a very long time. And I know there's a quality of his, so that's a very important thing, you know. So to keep in mind, so you have some elite, very important aspects. Free throw shooters one. So if he shot about 70%, 80%, that's very good, man. Okay, it's just hack a Derek Lively. He's okay. He's going to show 70% of them. But you have, if you have Shaq on the, at the free throw line, a decent modern NBA player, I don't know, Shaq is not the best example, but DeAndre Jordan, okay? If you have him, you can hack him, man. It's no problem. You're going to miss maybe two or score one, but that's okay. We got one point, baby. Hack Shaq. And, yeah. Or hack a Jordan, or hack a Mitchell Robinson. <laughs> it's crazy as well. But let's say, for example, Derek Lively is not a good playmaker. He shows the flashes. Okay, he shows the flashes. You bet on that, man. As the rest of the story clicks, why are you going to focus on him making the wrong reads in the pick and roll defense? Or if he bites on a punk fake too much, around the rim, he, they're 18 years old, bro. They have to learn something. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just yeah. come out high school and be the number one overall pick, just like in the old days. You know? But that's, mm -hmm. that, that, those errors are gone, I think. Those guys aren't going to be stars on day one. If Wembanyama goes number one, is he going to be a star in the NBA? Of course, and he's going to need some time. Or maybe he will, but I won't expect it from him right now because if you look at that body, he still has a lot of, you know, and his other team as well. He's going to to a new team now, the Metropolitans. He's going to play in Paris. He played at another town, Lyon. It's also a big city, but that, but that, that team was very cautious. So they were trying to keep him as healthy as possible, but hey, you just let him some play some more, man. Let him control some bodies on his own. So I, I know I'm going off topic for a long time. No, 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 it's cool, is, bro. You're good. Is that the most important thing that I've learned is the whole NBA draft is not a power ranking, man. The uh, player can be good at one week and better at the other, but it's all about the story. How it's going to translate in the NBA. So that's why a guy like, for example, Tyson uh, Daniel. It's not the flashiest guy, but he has such a scalable game. He's good at almost everything a team wants from a tall guard, wing, I want to call it. But he can be, for example, if you put him next to Trey Young, is are the Hawks going to be better at defense as a team? Of course he is. Is he going to help Trey Young getting less picked up on defense? Of course he is. He's going to pick him up. A guy like that makes everyone around him better. And I think that's the biggest attribute an NBA draft prospect can have is how much he's going to make the team better and going to make himself better. Of course, you have 
different tiers. I think if Derek White had coached number one and he ends up being a very good 3 and D or off the ball player, then that's a big waste at the number one pick, despite mm. how good he will be. Because if you're going to pick in the top two, you want to start. But if you got like a guy like, uh, for example, I'm just uh, using last year as an example. Okay? If we go use Grimes, he's going to be a very good three point shooter. The way right. he is now, very good defender. A two, on the two ways of the court, he's going to leave an impact. That's a big lottery pick. Lottery pick is what he is, in my opinion. And you pick him 25 because he, you can put him on another team. He'll plug and play, bro. He's going to do the same thing right there. If you go find those games, I think you have a good draft. I think that this year was a good example of that. Next season is loaded, but I still have a lot of watching to do. Man. So I, I, if you're yeah. going to ask me, yo, name me 20 names, I'm going to say no, nah, man. I just want to name me my, <laughs> the guys I'm confident about that I'm going to say the right things. You know? If you ask me about Thompson Brothers, for example, that was a good one. I haven't watched them enough. I haven't. Oh, no, I'm not, I don't. I, I, I won't kill you like that, man. No, absolutely no worries, man. I'm just... Yeah. I think for the 2023 draft, Knicks probably not going to draft anywhere near the lottery. But let's get to the Knicks, man. Last but not least, let's get to the Knicks. We can talk about them all, but the Knicks are... Oh, man. So, yeah, you ain't no on Twitter, man. You can't even mention certain plays without getting attacked. But let's... You know, you made a, you made a point on Twitter about Juice Randall, this being his, uh, a comeback year for him. Um, you know, there was an interview or a segment from uh, Mal and Rory. I don't know, you probably don't remember. There's uh, two guys who do interviews and... New York, uh, you spoke with Joe Buttons, and they spoke with, uh, at least one of them spoke with Juice Randall. Juice Randall spoke about him being comfortable uh, this year, that he, they, they're going to make a comeback. He doesn't know why, but he just feels really good about this year, obviously with the addition of Jalen Brunson. And you're hoping Donovan Mitchell comes through, but, you know, just real quick, you know, on uh, J, uh, Juice Randall before I move on to the Donovan Mitchell saga, you know, you brought up that you think it's going to be a resurgent year for Juice Randall. You think he's going to make a comeback. Um, you know, if you just talk about his game, what do you think went wrong last year? What do you think is going to change this year? Obviously, Jalen Brunson, a guard, getting the ball in his spots and you know take some, take away some of the pressure. But you seem to be really confident in Juice Randall making a resurgent uh, a recovery. I don't say recovery, but you know coming back this year, a revitalization to his game. Uh, so you can just speak on, on that uh, before we get to the Donovan Mitchell uh, saga. I think the whole Randall situation is all over the place, man. Let's be honest. I think he's the most hated guy in New York right now. And I think maybe even rightfully so, because what he did was unacceptable last season, the way he behaved on the court. And I'm not going to, you know, talk it good for him. I think I disagree with every other Knicks fan regarding that aspect. But I think the context that I want to add is he, if you look at the situation the Knicks are in, we want to trade for Spider. Whose team is it? Is it RJ's team? It's not. Man. Is it Randall's team? It's not, bro. It's no one's team right now. And Randall was put in a situation where he, you know, by default, by he was the biggest signing, uh, what is it, three years ago. It was his team. And in the, the, the COVID season, the last one, he delivered. He won most improved player. He 100% earned that contract extension. He was an all-star, all-NBA second team, you name it. And then he popped up on the scouting report some more. That's uh, one more guy to focus on. And, you know, that after the Raptors game, Nick Nurse, he... Finished his whole year, man. He just taught the league how to stop Julius Randle. And if you look at Julius Randle's game, look at his body, man. He can play bully ball with everyone. But why is he on the perimeter taking guys off the dribble, taking tough mid-range jumpers? Why, bro? Okay, he's doing it, but why isn't the, the front of getting him some help? Is Kemba Walker help? Is Kevin Fournier help? Of course not, man. The Boston the Celtics ditched those two guys and they made it to the finals and almost won everything. If you have Evan Fournier on the team, do you think they were going to make it to the finals? I don't. And they basically, we were happy with uh, the guy who shot two on the trees, and this was incredible. And he basically got in RJ Barrett's way because what I did saw with Julius Mantle, despite all the other shenanigans, but he was trying to put RJ in the spot, man. From, okay, you're going to take this role, man. Here, you're going to demand the ball some more, make some plays, make sure that you're going to take this game over. He was trying to put him in a spot. And I think you can. Tell you, say what about the guy what you want, but he he did try, man. And RJ Barrett is being misused by the coach, he's been put in the corner. Look at some highlights from the Knicks, you're gonna see RJ Barrett waiting for the ball in the corner. That's because they ice him because he's off ball and on ball, and they 
he has to create something from there, but he's just waiting there for the ball, man. I think that's a bad situation to be in because everyone was talking about giving RJ the max. Well, are you going to give a, a guy who stands in the corner as a spot of shooter? Are you going to give that guy the max? He was one of the worst finishes at the rim last season, but that's not on him because he gets to the rim, man. If he has the ball in his hands, he's an excellent pick-and-roll playmaker, especially the sync we had with Mitchell Robinson. We all saw it, man, but he doesn't use it. I think this team is so bad coached. Front office is not recognizing what this team needs. And last season, we saw it every team, man. I think the whole Burks playing point guard was just... It was just the season's over. So just fuck this. And, you know, we were going to watch... We're going to see whatever this season brings. And we're going to be the play in And then we play the play And then we're going to be in the lottery. We're going to wait until we get 13 pictures. Like that. It's just like that type of season. But with Jalen Brunson... I think they got the most important thing, and that was rim pressure. And this team didn't have rim pressure. RJ was the only one. And RJ was being put in, in the corner to wait for, uh, I don't know who was going to create the space for him, but I didn't see it. It was Julius Randle by default with his spin move and the turnovers. And, you know, it's you can put the blame on him. You can put the blame on the coach, but the whole situation is not going to change. But with Jalen Brunson, I think it's going to change, man, because the rim pressure with him is real. You have another very good playmaker in your backcourt. I think R.J. Barrett is going to be the second one. You have Amino quickly, who really developed as a player on both ends of the court, especially as a defender. And I think this team has a lot of pieces. Man, you have Grimes as well. Obi, of course, the logjam on the roster with him and uh, Ren was a tough one. But that's another problem that I think other teams would love to have if you have two very good forwards. But we are the only team that uh, basically, I think, hates the idea. Because we want to play one guy, but we also have the other guy who's signing a big fat extension is going in. But everyone wants to get him out of town, and I think that's the big problem. Is you got to give the guy one more chance, man. If he plays one more bad season, bro, just wave him, stretch the provision, and be bad for four years. I don't care. He has to go, but you got to give him one more chance. Man. I think Julius Randle. If you look at two years ago, if you look at the start of last season, not even preseason. I'm not gonna watch that stuff, but he was good, and he showed some flashes. I think the Warriors game on the road where he won against the NBA champions, that was one of the Julius Randle's games for two years ago, but he shouldn't be in that position, man, to be the first option. He shouldn't be in that position, but he is, and you can blame him, but I don't, I don't think he's the right guy to blame him. That you, you, you brought up some great points, because, I mean, he's not a number one guy. He's being used as such. You know, but the attitude that to me, I always think he's going to regress, right? When I watch Julius Randle, I don't see him as his perennial all NBA player, right? That's the Jokic's, those are the Beads, the Bookers, yeah, the not Tatums, even not even close. So he just had a superlative season. And granted, he had a season where for every the stars aligned, right? Tom Tibble comes in, they sat some defensive parts and guys like Bullock, obviously RJ Barrett, they had some, even from Alfred Payne for the minutes he played, even though he was not a Good play overall. He still provides you some defensive minutes, um, and so everything just aligned for Juice Randall. And I, I and he never, he was never able to process it to be like, all right, look, I'm not going to reach the heights I did the year before. That's not my game. Okay, let me incorporate a little more pick and roll and actually rolling to the basket with guys like Kemba Walker was here, right? Let me actually run a two man game with me and RJ back. There's no reason why me and RJ shouldn't be running pick and roll. We're in trouble. It should be me and RJ destroying every – just two physical plays playing pick and roll constantly, whether it's a pistol, whether it's – whatever it may be. We need to have physicality on the ball to, towards the basket. There's no reason why those two had such a plus four minus when you look at their possessions and they both had average 20 points. That makes absolutely no sense. So that's just terrible chemistry, right? But on the – and, and I, I get it, like – he shouldn't have put in that place, but I just felt like his attitude. And then the whole middle finger that I don't, I've seen my own New York athletes do worse. I just felt his attitude and his approach to the league figuring, figuring him out was just so poor. Now, you have Jalen Brunson coming in, um, but Jalen is also leaving. He's leaving a, a, a guy, a gravity playing Luka Doncic. And I like I like I went to Jalen Brunson since last year. This is a guy, high pedigree guy, obviously the father played on those Villanova teams. Uh, with Spellman, DiVincenzo, Macau Bridges won a championship. Um, you know, when you look at his game, it, he's such a smart, surreal player. It's, it's, it's beautiful to watch, but he is playing away from Luka Doncic. Now, 
do you think that he's going to have that a similar impact like he had last year, finally starting with Luka Doncic in that backcourt? And, you know, when the game's outside Luka Doncic, he actually played relatively well, 20 points. Average like 20 points, I think 35% from the field, 80-something percent from the stripe, 7.8 assists or something like that. He, he played well. They went like 8-9 or whatever. But again, you're not playing Luka Doncic, and this is for your next how many for the probably for the rest of your, your career, right? How do you see Jalen Brunson and his impact on this Knicks team? You know, you alluded to you know maybe Randall falls back in line, but what about guys like RJ Barrett? I mean, like what about uh, even guys like uh, uh, Fournier, uh, uh, Cam Reddish, Grimes? How do you see Jalen Brunson? Is is he going to be a dribble drive kick out type of facilitator? Do you see like what what do you envision? Uh, Jalen uh, for Jalen Brunson regarding his impact on this next team next season. I think Tom Thibodeau finally has the things that we're looking for, man. I think some old school mm-hmm. basketball, harder to rim, dribble drive. I think the kickouts are maybe the modern touch to the game. You have some excellent spot up shooters and Grimes especially. RJ, I like him as a shooter as well. Not not his best quality, but I like him a lot. I think Jalen Brunson is going to be the number one option on this team. And let's be honest, man, the only reason that he's leaving the Western Conference Finals is. He doesn't want to be second fiddle. He want to make a role. And the Dallas Bears couldn't give him because you have Luca. If I had Luca, I was I wouldn't give him the number of keys with the offense. Why would I? And he knew that. And they had a chance to extend it. I didn't do it. So it's the GM's poor decision making really working in our favor. And you got him at a decent to good deal, I think. If you look at the money, it's a descending deal. And as in a couple of years you can make some move. He has a tradable contract and we're not going to talk about trading right now, but he is, he has everything that the Knicks need. The Knicks, I think, I'm not just have the stats in front of me, but I'm I'm 100% sure that in the top five worst teams in terms of rim attempts, finishing at the rim, in the mid range, you name it, bro. The Knicks were bad at it, and you fixing that with him. His rim pressure is real. He's an excellent playmaker. In the pick and roll, we don't have good Roman, we don't have good screen setters, so being a good pick and roll playmaker is not going to help him in this team, but he's going to figure it out. I think Mitchell Robinson has to be better this year. He doesn't have a choice anymore. And he's working hard in the offseason. He got the bread, so he's um, I think morally obligated to finally work in his game, but that's another, uh, that's another subject. But regarding Brunson, if you give him the keys to your offense, if you make RJ Barrett your second option, this is the best case scenario, right? Because we have Randall he's not going to accept this but if those guys are going to be your backcourt you have some more low usage guys just like Grimes in a spot of shooter and you know be a plus defender and Mitchell Robinson at 5 we basically if you dump it off every now and then to him he'll finish or just throw it up really high and he will catch it I don't know how he catches it every time but that's his role that's not, never going to change but but he's also very versatile, man. I think he can run some excellent DHOs as well with a guy like Hartenstein in the second unit. Or you can use him at very different positions. You can use him as a starter. You can maybe get him off the bench with Manuel Quickly as a backcourt. It doesn't matter who runs point because Manuel Quickly makes up for the size difference. I think Jalen Brunson, that's the most underrated part of this game. He's a good defender. Man. You can look at the size and say, okay, six foot one, six foot two, bad. But that's not fair because he has that toughness, man. I think off the ball is very good, and he's going to be picked up on picked on on defense. But it happens when you're an undersized guard, and he handled it very well. I think if you look at that Sun series, if you look at Utah series as well, Luca wasn't there, and Jalen Brunson really made it fair game until he came back, and that's a big accomplishment. Man. And he really excelled as a microwave shooter, as microwave scorer as well, together with Dinwiddie. So he accepted every role that they used him in, and he said, I want a bigger role, and New York is giving him that bigger role, so you have to get it. And I think if Julius Randle takes five or six field goal attempts less in a game, he's just like you said, he's going to screen hard every game, every position, screen hard and roll. If he gets the ball or not, it doesn't matter. If he screen hard and roll and gets some more of his off-ball plays in the uh, sync, because... Let's be honest, man. Last season, he was a dumpster fire. But if he, in the moments that he played off ball, he really created a lot of space for his team. Julius Randle. If he plays bully ball inside the, inside the paint, he really set his spot of shooter open because the help defense has to come, man, because there's not a lot of defense in the league that's going to stop Julius Randle. 
he won't get to the rim in a post up. And that's the that that's the big advantage with Tom Thibodeau. He's an old school coach. He has to bring back that old school play in the post, man. Just beat him in the post and let him eat. Just you know, have some dribble drive to the paint and you know, dump it off to Mitchell Robinson or I don't know. Just, just try something else, man. I don't want to see that kind of perimeter handling the ball anymore. And you, yeah, you now have the guy to have the guys on the team to take the ball out of his hands. And I'm not, mm. I'm a little bit trolling the NBA Twitter with the king of New York, and that's that's just my thing, man. But, but I think the most people really think I like the guy. I like him, but after last season, it's it's a whole different thing, man. I just want it to be good. After yeah. year two, I, I, I'm gonna be honest, man. I, I wanted him to be a Nick forever, but now it's yeah, love of that went. <laughs> yeah, you you make a good point you, with uh, Tom yeah. Tibble and the Bigs, and that's why I think Isaiah Hartenstein is so important because you know what he had with Jakim Noah was the smart, you know, Jakim Noah boozer, even Cat to an extent because Cat's still a talented player. He's just you know, he has a, doesn't put it all together a lot of times. Is that but what he had in those guys is these high level playmakers? So good. Yeah, but he is. But and, and Tom Thibodeau now he has Isaiah Hartenstein. I'm not saying he's in that class, but he has a mold of a of a big who can actually facilitate, operate, especially from that pinch post, right? That's what Jakim Noah did. You look at the, the triangle plays, you know, even horns, right? He loves running triangle horns. Well, triangle less now, he still runs it, but triangle horns, he loves a you know the high pick and roll, spain pick and roll. Um, and you need from that pinch position, you need your bigs to be a little bit more versatile than just a roll it to the basket. And with Mitchell Robinson, he's a very poor roller to the basket. So, you know, I, I like what they did with Isaiah Hartenstein. Hopefully, Randall can understand, okay, now he doesn't have to be the man. Let me try to fall in line and make those passes. And, and Randall, at times, he can make good dribble handoffs, right? His screens aren't the best, he but he has a decent feel of it. Right, and he has a good feel when he's, when he's motivated to make those plays from the pinch, right? You're just hoping that he could put out and but now you have guys like Isaiah Hart inside to kind of bolster that. So hopefully Tom Thibodeau and you said, you know, Brunson and, and IQ. I would love to see everyone. I, there's so many things in terms of so many rotations I'm interested in seeing this season with the Knicks, especially with the addition of Isaiah Hartenstein, Brunson. Um, and also, yes, like you said, look, RJ Barrett. So RJ Barrett, I think, I think it's two ways with two way with what how they're using him, right? I do think he had to become a better shooter because at Duke he was not a good shooter, especially from the outside, right? He is a field type of player. The last two, his first two, three seasons of the league, he start he has his terrible starts of the season. He's a field type of guy, right? I understand them put him in the corner so he can become a better corner shooter. But you know, Tom Thibodeau did put him a little bit more in the read and react last year. But then at the end of last year, he do weird things where RJ Bad for like two, three games straight, read and react, right? The the, the heat game. Uh, well, I think he had like a 46. I know he still lost, but that was just read and react all day against the Heat. 46, so I forgot, 40 something points. Um, but then he'll have games where, like you said, it'll just be okay, stuck, stick him in the corner. And yet Burks is struggling to beat his, come up, uh, you know, beat his man, uh, beat the defense off the screens or beat his man one. I'm like, why do we do this to RJ? So hopefully this year with RJ Barrett and Brunson, you see that, um, you see RJ Barrett again take that next step. I love to see rotations that use RJ Barrett in, alongside Brunson, IQ, Isaiah Hartenstein. I, I really like Isaiah Hartenstein. So I know guys like a Duke and he was caught by Isaiah Hartenstein way before, but Isaiah Hartenstein I think is going to be in his role going to be really special. But last question I want to ask before we head out of here, man, because I know it's stupid late over there. I'll keep you up. Play. I apologize. I love this. Uh, I, I love this talk, man. Talk to me about Donovan Mitchell, his potential impact. On this team, who comes out the victor in this in this war between Ainge? Because you know Danny Ainge, he is a ruthless negotiator. Man, he's not messing around. He was able to fleece one of the worst. I, the, the the words that I'm saying right now does not reflect the views of Ursin Demir. Billy King is one of the worst GMs of all time, and Danny Ainge was able to fleece this guy, build that foundation with Tatum and. And uh, uh, Brown, on the flip side, you got Leon Rose. He has Brock Aller has at his disposal. Um, the Strew Capologist, they're not going to sit there. They're not trying to make deals that leave them uh, at a disadvantage. So talk to me about who comes, who comes out the victor in this deal. Because, again, the Knicks, in my humble opinion, I think we have the most leverage in terms of picks and players. Other teams that they said were interested, the Hornets, Washington, uh, we've done – 
bunch of videos. The Heat, we've done a bunch of videos in terms of the assets. They don't compare to the Knicks. In terms of have they actually even put out an offer, you have not seen anything regarding any of their offers. So it just seems as if Danny Ainge is playing up to the media to try to put it out there. The Knicks have a leverage. I say there's too much. I'm not get, Unless another team comes into play, I'm not budging off the two unprotected. Now, if a team comes in and they, and they say the Pelicans, a team that I think that they have the assets and the players, right, in my humble opinion, and uh, forget uh, now they say the Cavaliers, but Cavaliers again have not put out offer put out an offer. If those teams don't come into play, I'm not giving up more than two unprotected. If they come into play, and it, it, it maybe the turning point is just one more unprotected, which would be three, which is still a lot, then maybe maybe I, I don't have to give up a player. But I'm not moving off that two unprotected five first rounders. Um, the uh, I think it was with Grimes and Evan Fournier or some some combination. To kind of make the money work with Fournier and somebody else, I'm not moving off of that. And then I would also like for you to talk about: Do you trade RJ Barrett? Now there've been rumors of the Utah Jazz with RJ Barrett. First, it was why would they want R- they didn't want RJ because they don't want to resign him to a contract. They don't want to have that on their cap or have you know trade basically trade play it for rental. Be like, all right, we're not going to sign this guy. Now they're coming out saying the decision makers in the Knicks front office that would don't mind trading RJ Barrett according to. Ian Begley, who's you know a reputable guy, and now Utah somehow they want RJ back. I think it's a lot of hogwash, but in theory, you're gonna talk about Donovan Mitchell's impact, and do you make the trade, and then would you trade RJ back? Because I want Donovan Mitchell to play alongside RJ back. I think RJ back is right there in terms of figuring out as his overall playmaker, a guy who could be of a Jimmy Butler type of mold. I, I, I love it because to me, RJ back his greatest strength is that he knows he's not as good as other players, so he works maniacally hard to get better. And certain things. I think it's just a small little click, a small little improvement in touch and the paint, all that stuff. But do you trade a guy like RJ Barrett to get a dominant Mitchell? Please take it away, person. Regarding this raid, I want to make one thing clear. I'm not a guy that's you know, gonna, you know, take, you know, change his opinion when I'm dating peace, man. But with Donovan Mitchell, I had to. I was caught in the FOMO, I was caught in the hype. I wanted this guy, but now I don't want Donovan Mitchell. I really don't want him wow. in New York because. First of all, I think the price is crazy. Who are who is Nick's outbidding? Who is Nick's biggest competitor? Why do the Utah Jazz have left? They don't have the leverage, bro. They want to rebuild, and they made it very clear with the Rudy Gobert. You have a three-time defensive player of the year. You trade him away. You have two guys that are are your stars, and they fail to deliver with one of the best defensive players in the NBA today in the last ten years, easily. And now you're going to sell this guy for six picks, unprotected, five, and all the crazy things. Who can offer three or four? No one in the league. So why would the Knicks pay what the Utah Jazz is offering? I think it's basic economics. It's just, you know, yeah, how much uh, how much yeah, demand is there and how much uh, we can offer, you know? So can you find a guy like Donovan Mitchell next year? He's two years from now. He's going you know, to start trades. SGA is a good one. Those come available every now and then. And you have got to wait for the right moment. And I think if you trade for Donovan Mitchell in a, in a scenario, okay, we trade for Donovan Mitchell and uh, they get salary, salary fillers, IQ top, and then five. Okay, the picks don't really matter. But what I'm trying to say is how is Tom Thibodeau is going to handle the log jam of this one? RJ, if you want it to be good, you have to give him the ball in his hands. You sign Jalen Brunson, you promised him to give the ball in his hands. And you get Donovan Mitchell now, he wants the ball in his hands. You have Julius Randle, he has the ball in his hands, he's not giving it away. And you have Mitchell Robinson, who doesn't want the ball. So you have four guys who want the ball in his hands, capable guys, and you have, you have Mitchell Robinson. How is this team going to work? And how is the defense going to be? How is the spacing on this team going to I think Julius Randle, Donovan Mitchell, yeah, Barrett in the corner. How is the spacing of this team going to look like? I think there are... There are more questions than answers right now for this whole trade. And if you look at the offer, Grimes, I don't want to lose Grimes man, because he's the perfect role player. And you very, it's very hard to find those guys. And I know role players, if you look at his R's, the role player, you can find an easy role player. You can't find a guy like that. The impact he has on defense in terms of shooting, I think you, he's satisfied being used as a spot of shooting. And he's going to be a very good wing defender. That you can use in your second unit, that you can use in your starting lineup, in your closing lineup, and that's the guy you're going to trade away. You picked him for the what, 25th pick. 
he had one season, he was injured, and now going to give up on him for Donovan Mitchell, who you don't have the facilities for. And even Donovan Mitchell, man, he had Rudy Gobert. Is he going to be better with Mitchell Robinson? Not a shot at Mitch, because I really like Mitch as a rim protector. I think he's one of the best rim protectors in the NBA, easily. But the rest of the stuff is just, you know, it just needs a couple of years or more to really take his game to the next level. But he's elite at what he does. He can be a lot better, but he's already very good at what he does. But he's not a type of center that's going to be in Donovan, Donovan Mitchell's favor. I think the best thing is just to let this deal go. Just let Utah Jazz, I hope they get 10 picks from another team that's going to win in the draft. Because they're not, they're the team is not there. But the Miami can offer Tyler Hill. We are getting back. You're getting your picks and a ball dominant player that is not used to be playing as a star. Because the Miami Heat is not using him as a star. Who is the Cavs going to offer? They don't going to offer Allen, Garland, or Mobley. Who's left on the roster that you're going to rebuild around? No one. Marketing? Or or in terms of the trade? Yes. I would rather have Fournier in the market, yeah. For example, just uh, put it in context. If you name another team that's going to be used, the Lakers. The Lakers have got nothing left, though. They're broke. They drive a Lamborghini. (laughs) But, uh, but, you know, but they got the. The depth twice as big as <laughs> they can sell the Lamborghini there or so. Westbrook, okay, the cap is nice. You can get some lot of, um, you can get a lot of cash space next year, but the Utah Jazz are going to rebuild. So, right. are going to, who can use the cap space? Well, going to, I don't know who the free agent next year. Or let's say, for example, John Wall. Speaks. Are they going to give a max to John Wall or maybe a resign with us? I don't think so. The Jazz have zero leverage. They want to get rid of this guy, but they want to get, you know, to have a team pay uh, them uh, dollars for a guy that's very good, an all-star, but not a superstar. And if you compare it to other trades in the NBA, Paul George, the Clippers signed Kawhi Leonard, and he wanted the second guy. And the, Kawhi, the Clippers had to go all in. And they signed Paul George. They put Paul George, and they overblow the AKC with the shit out of picks, more than, less than what the Utah Jazz want, and he's a superstar. He's a two-way superstar. The whoa, 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 whoa. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, oh, I'm sorry. You said poor George is a two-way soup. Oh, man. Yeah, man. Oh, yeah. man. Ursi, you about to get me in trouble, man. Paul George. Ah, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, man. I can't. Go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry. The second one, Oof. Minnesota Timberwolves. They won the playoffs. They needed help at defense, man, and they needed to defend really bad. They got one of the best defenders in the NBA. We go bad. So... Those two teams were really trying something. The Clippers were trying to win, and they have two injuries. So, you know, this year is the first glimpse of what the team was supposed to be. And the Minnesota Timberwolves are going to be a problem next season. Man. Edwards is going to be a future star. They already had Colin and three towns. Now they got Gobert. The team, the team is stacked with a lot of good role players as well. The team as a whole makes a lot of sense. And they were unlucky against the Grizzlies because they blew away a lot of leads, and eventually they were eliminated. They wouldn't have made it against the play, the Warriors, but that's okay because it's the first year and now they trying to contend. But the Knicks are not trying to contend. The Knicks need to figure out who the, whose team this is. That's number one. And Donovan Mitchell is not the player that's going to make you a contender. I don't believe it. So the best option for me personally is to let this one walk. And hopefully the Utah Jazz will get 100 picks in, uh, from another team for them because they won't. And they, their people will not work because Donovan Mitchell will win you games. So they're going to be a, maybe a sixth, seventh seed again. You got Clarkson, Bogdanovic, you got Donovan Mitchell. I think that's a very good team still. So they can, uh, they can still maybe win 45 games, maybe get the seventh, eighth seed in the West easily because that's a stacked team, no matter if the coach left or not. So. If you compare it to those two other trades that I named, is yeah, why would the Knicks pay such a high price? And people are saying the Timberwolves set the market. The Timberwolves draft picks are not going to be lottery picks. You have Anthony Edwards, is 21 years old. You have Cat, 25, 26. Gobert is 30 years old. In what scenario is that team is going to be so bad that it's going to give you a top five thing? I think you gave the perfect example with the Nets. They traded for old guys, and they had one or two seasons to try something, and they failed. 
So they were giving the Celtics uh, the number uh, three pick as it was, I think, maybe the number mm-hmm. four pick, and they got uh, the next two superstars thanks to the Nets. And the Knicks, unprotected picks, if you get Donovan Mitchell, it's not going to be a lot of pick either. If you have Bronson, if you have RJ Barrett, who is, if he ever makes it to 50% of what we expect from him, that's a good player. And the Knicks are not going to be bad for a long time either. So let's be honest, why would the Knicks do that? The, the, the Minnesota Timberwolves didn't set the market. I think the picks that they offer are not valuable in mm. naming it as, you know, a legit first-round pick. It's going to be picks in the 20s. And, of course, you have to pay more picks if you want a guy like Gobert. But the Knicks unprotected picks, if you don't have anything, and if, uh, let, for example, Barrett leaves four years and you have to start over with the team you have, those picks are unprotected are very valuable. So, for example, if I give Paul George again, I know you were blown away by the uh, two-way superstar. Like, well, I really stand by that take, man. I think he's uh, easily a top 15 player in the league, if healthy. He is. If he's not healthy, then he can play. But he is. I think and both in two ways, man. He's one of the best. But Donovan Mitchell is not good at defense, man. That's my last point. I think in his first two seasons, you saw what he could be. And after the other three years, it was like, right, I already got this, man. The bubble was cute. He scored 50, but he gave up 50, bro. So you can score 60 and give up 60. What are you going to do? <laughs> I'd rather have a guy score 15 and give up 8. Right. Then... I, I agree with that. I've... So that's no, why I, I don't want it. Oof. It's, it's t- and look, we, right now, man, that's why it's like all these reports, man. We are We are – it seems as if, you know, we're bidding against ourselves. You made a good point. It's like, why, why even play this game of names? That's why I said, look, if, 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 unless other teams are coming into play, right, you make a, and you make an excellent point too about the Gobert thing, because I never believed that Gobert was so-called set in the market, because I, I take it from the standpoint of the Timberwolves are a dumb organization. They, they make weird, they're going to make weird, they have since the days of David Kahn and they're going to make weird moves. So it's like, I wouldn't use them as a barometer per se. But you make a great point. Those picks that the Wolves are giving up, that's not a that's not a lottery team. That's not a team that's going to do bad. They're going to probably be in the playoffs at the very worst to play in. So like, you have to have a stinker of a season between Cat, Anthony Edwards, and Gorbeer, right? Uh, and I just don't see that happen. You st- you st- I think Jay McDaniels is still there, I believe. Yeah, um, because Paul is legit. All-star caliber players, if it's all lens, you know, because Jalen McDaniels are on the one. He needs some time, but the team's not going to be bad, bro. But the Knicks don't have to yeah. attack. That's the big difference. All right. So I, I I agree with you a billion percent, man. Do not allow Danny Ainge to play. I'm not trying to build a dynasty or foundation for another team, and then you have a weird. Because again, here's what I said: Donovan Mitchell, I love this game. I think he's probably in terms of you know just have fun with the dribble handlers and everything. I think he doesn't get enough credit. I think. In terms of a, a, an absolute scoring beast, he can do that. Um, but is he a guy that the Knicks need? No. The Knicks don't need him. And we're not in a position right now. We still have to figure out, okay, what is RJ, right, if he's not traded? Okay, what are we doing with Randall? How do we kind of refine his game, even if it's to trade him off in a few years or whatever, build his value back up? What is it? This team needs an identity. And Brunson is start, but Jalen uh, – uh, Donovan Mitchell – isn't an end-all be-all. He's not the guy who's going to get us to the chip um, anytime soon. So I agree with you. But Ursa, man, I appreciate you, my brother, man. We got to do this more often. You are the man, bro. Uh, please let them know where they can find you again, bro. Uh, please let them, let them know how they can reach out to you, how they can find your clips, your breakdowns, your analysis, man. Please let the folks know. Yeah, you can find me on Twitter at EDemberMBA. I tweet. I think 80% of the time about the NBA draft and about the NBA in general, mostly rookies and sophomores. At first, it was all about the mix, but now I'm trying to let that one a little bit walk some more and talk about other teams as well. I'm basically trying to tweet about all, all the 30 teams and about the draft. And so I got my hands full on that. And I also, I, I, I want to start my YouTube channel. I already got one. I post some clips about on that sometime. So with the same handle, eat them and they can find me on YouTube as well. But it's really, it's really basic. So I, I'm trying to expand that as one of my goals of this season to make some scouting videos myself, some text and some ed- editing it, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're interested in that, you can find them there as well. 
but I'm reading nonstop about NBA draft prospects. So you have, if you're looking for a guy's notes, I throw my notes out with my tweets, man. Everything that I see, I tweet out. And I tried to, last year I've got about 60 guys that I was, if you ask me any time of the day, I could tell you everything about those 60 guys. I'm trying to expand that to 100 this year because the expense is way more loaded. But I have a long way to go, man, because I think if, if we, I've got 10 nights that I'm going to be 100% sure. The rest is, I need some more time, man. And it's just the season hasn't even begun yet. So, me getting to 10 is even a good sign for me. So, if you're looking for a guy that's tweeting nonstop about, about the NBA, about the draft, and is not backing down to show his opinion, no matter if it's consensus or not, then I'm your guy, man. You got to you gotta hook me up, man. And my DMs are always open. If you want to talk hoops, just hit me up. And they get very, very humble, dude, man. I appreciate it, man. I, I like, I try to like almost all your posts if I see them. Sometimes I don't even remember to like them just because I'm watching the film. Like, oh, damn, man. I got to watch more of these dude. Man. Oh, crap, this guy. Oh, damn. So I didn't even see that when he did that. Yo, how did I miss that? So trust me, man. I look, especially on the international tip, man. Your guy, Erson Demir. I, he's probably not, in a few years, he's probably not going to be here. He's probably going to blow up. So for the time you have, man, I'm going to try to have him. On a few guy, more times, man. man. I'm, I'm trying to have this guy a few more times before he blows up. You know what I'm saying? He, yeah. He's in, you know, he's in the, he's in the, 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 the freaking Ferragamo sneak, uh, shoes and the, 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 the European suits, and he can't talk to us little uh, 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 plebs anymore. But nah, person, man, it, the guy, bro. It, it was a pleasure, bro. Definitely gonna have you back on, man. I appreciate it, pleasure, guys. Bro. I had a lot of fun, man. And then I, big, I, big I shout out to you, Legion. Big shout out to your audience as well. And you know. I didn't know when you when you asked me, I was on it, man. Because if I look at the YouTube channel, I was uh, I knew it was big time, you know. Because we go back and forth on Twitter a lot of ways as well, so it was a very logical choice to come on. But I want to come on some more, man. You know, I want to definitely easily like more. So let's do it, man. Easy, and a big shout easy. out to everyone listening to the to the to the show, man. I hope I, I hope I didn't overblow you guys with my take. Oh, no, no. And, and trust me, right now is, is dead season, whatever. But once it starts to pick up, like, it's going to be a lot more, man. But, uh, yeah, and you got now you got Sherwin talking. Sherwin said he's agree with you. And Sherwin is crazy. He Everything I say, Sherwin typically hates on him, mis, mistakes me. So you got some love for Sherwin. But definitely, he, he, trust me, it, it, once the season starts, I mean, we got, and as soon as Biden's watching, it's going to pick up during the season. So definitely going to have you on a lot more. But. On that note, man, guys, I appreciate it. Please hit the like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Uh, definitely going to chop this up to uh, have the, uh, the segments. There's a lot more things I want to discuss, but I'm not – I got to let this guy actually have a life. So, Urson, I appreciate it. Everybody, peace, God bless. I will see you guys later. Peace. Take care, guys.